Choo-choo! Sure do. Sure Some objects, gorgeous, gargantuans, and authentic, because though they died out so long ago, their fossil bones remain, so we know just what they were like and can even sculpt them into still or rather extinct life. Money well spent. I love all the science I've picked up over the past year or so. Tradition.
your research is required. That's why paleontology is such an exciting science. It's like we're always learning new things all the time. To mount the skeleton. Um, really, really cool. Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's so good to have all of you here right now. Welcome, welcome to the broadcast. We're going to have a fun, pretty chill stream today. I know we had a really long one yesterday. Covered a lot of ground on Komodo dragons. Today, it's going to be a little bit more chill. We're going to kind of casually go over some fossil news. And uh, then we're going to celebrate Thursday Birds Day after that. So I hope you're as excited as I am. It's going to be good. Uh, if anybody's here for the very first time, then please allow me to introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. So that means talking about fossils. Talking about my own work, the work of my colleagues, what we've been able to discover as paleontologists, as fossil scientists, about the incredible history of life on our amazing planet Earth. And what it means for you, watching at home. Uh, as a dinosaur paleontologist, I do a few things. I dig up dinosaurs during the summer in the western U.S., working with various museums. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. And uh, nowadays, I actually make my living, pay the bills, by streaming here on Twitch. So I feel incredibly lucky as a scientist to be able to kind of marry together my science outreach and my day job. It's pretty extraordinary that I get to do this, and it's because of this remarkable community here. All of these wonderful supporters who donate to the channel, and uh, yeah. uh, they've opened up a niche for me here on this platform, and that's pretty incredible. So thank you, thank you, all of you wonderful, wonderful supporters. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Like I said, today we're going to be covering some fossil news. There's a new paper that just came out a few days ago about spinosaur brains. Dinosaurs became extinct because they no longer knew how to love each other. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Exactly. And I certainly wouldn't <laughs> want our species to end the same way. Um, thank you, thank you, Athena Cat, for the eight months of support. Above and beyond, Athena Cat, thank you, thank you for, um keeping me here on the air. Thanks for helping pay the bills. I really appreciate that, Athena Cat. And I hope you're enjoying using those emotes and all the other special privileges that come with subscribing. Um, and Kenzie Minx, thank you for the follow. Uh, welcome to Paleontologide. Yeah. If anybody watching right now, if you are even the least bit curious about this incredible world around us and its long and storied history, if you're curious about the fossil record, about extinction, evolution. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you, Travel the World. Uh, thank you, Travel. I do need to change that, huh? Um, I completely missed that. Uh, yeah, let's change that. But uh, if you're at all curious about anything to do with natural history, maybe most especially dinosaurs, since that's actually what I study, what I work on, what I publish on, what I dig up, then you're in the right place. Don't be shy with your questions. All right, Thursday, science, outreach, sub-goal. Uh, all caps. When I try and type at an angle like this, it messes everything up. Uh, and let's make that a solid 4-0. Beautiful. Thank you, Travel. I appreciate you. Anyway, before we get into our fossil news today, Let's scroll up. We'll see who's here. We'll do some greetings. And then we'll get the science kicked off for the day. How does that sound, everybody? Uh, Kodali appears to have maybe been first today. How you doing, Kodali? Welcome, welcome. Golganek, what's shaking with you? Great to see you, Golganek, as it always is. Uh, Jody Fish, hello, hello. How are you doing? Uh, Travel the World says hello, all. Hello to you, Travel. 
stalwart supporter travel the world thank you so much for your generosity it's good to have you here uh tactile 3d picture howdy howdy how are you doing Sci Ant streams balint i hope all is well with you it's really good to see you welcome back balint i hope you and uh and lita and the baby are doing well uh, Fans Derego, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologon. Luna Seer. What's shaking with you, Luna Seer? I hope things are good. Uh, and the Lenina. Good afternoon to you and to yours, Lenina. Um, Lenina, I have that envelope here. We'll be opening this later. And, uh, oh, thank you, Nell. I really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to a Dino-tastic evening with you, too, now. Thank you for the 300 bits. Uh, yeah. And, uh... Kumimanu for Daisai. What is that, Gimplag? I'll have to look that up. I'm not familiar with that taxon. It's probably a modern bird, isn't it? Very appropriate for Thursday Bird's Day, if that's the case. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that when I get down to the bottom of chat, Gimplag. That'll be a nice way to start off. Uh, and Hogan, I have seen that. Yeah, that countdown of... What was it? Top 10 discovery? I did my top 22 dinosaur discoveries. Or new dinosaur taxa of 2022? Or maybe it was discoveries. Anyway, I don't I don't think any of them were covered in that list. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, who else have we got? Christoph, Christoph Howard. Welcome back, Kristoff. I'm so glad you've returned. Uh, it's good to have you back. Are you going to become a regular here, Kristoff? I really hope so. Welcome back. Uh, Rehabifion, what's shaking with you? Good to see you. Arle, 0501. Arle, I hope you're doing really well. It's good to see you, too. Yeah. Not the brain, hello to you, too. Welcome, welcome. JMM6511, how you doing, JMM? Uh, and XF Kirsten, I'm so glad your headache is gone. I'm glad you're feeling better, Kirsten. Moonrise Rabbit's here too. What's shaking, Moonrise Rabbit? Iacane Powda is here. Iacane, chickens are dinosaurs, as are all birds. Welcome, Iacane. I hope you're having a good week. It's good to see you, as it always is, Iacane. Welcome back. Yeah. Good song. Yeah. All right, scrolling down, scrolling down. Uh, Moondrop Soup, did I say hello to you yet? Welcome, Moondrop Soup. Uh, Zorox Double Eight, how you doing, Zorox? Welcome to Paleontologizing, once again. Uh, Roland Eliart, did I say hello to you yet, Roland? And some people have seen that welcome video for the first time, or the cold open video, rather. Yeah. Uh, Travels is always the best introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Travel. Ed, yeah. Let's just say I was inspired by a strange monolith that I found out in the middle of the, middle of the desert. Um, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hope the new paper doesn't scoop yours. No, Jody Fish. In fact, I've read the abstract so far of the new paper, and that's it. But, uh, shoot, I forgot to check if it's open or open access or paywalled. But, uh... It's consistent with my findings on Spinosaurids with my co-author. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. Um... JMM was asking what uh, Thursday Bird's Day is. There's an explanation right there in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Gita, aloha. Aloha to you, Gita. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah. Always good when new papers support other papers. Yeah, Jody Fish, absolutely. Um, rather, it's it's not inconsistent with our findings, which is good, you know. Uh, yeah, I will have to rewrite part of the manuscript to include this, but yeah. Dr. Javasaurus, what's shaking with you? Good to see you. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at uh, Kumi Manu Fordaisai. What was this? Oh, we talked about this uh, a little while ago. We did a 
part of a stream on this. Yeah. Ancient monster penguin is largest ever discovered and weighed as much as a gorilla. Holy cow. Yeah. Pretty impressive. We were talking about this last time. Or, not last time. On a previous stream. In fact, if we go to the YouTube page. Here. There we go. Go to videos. Oh, it's the last... Shoot. This is from three days ago? No, hang on. February 9th. I have I've fallen behind in posting my VODs. I'm so busy. But, uh... Yeah, holy cow. We were talking all about this critter. Uh... When was that? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, very nice. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, yeah. Really cool gigantic penguin uh, from New Zealand. We were talking all about uh, like the origin of penguins and how recently these creatures, well, how soon after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs did penguins evolve. And thank you, Jacob Neon. For the two gift subs there, really appreciate that, Jacob. Jacob. Appreciate that, Jacob Neon. What is it? Why does it say that you gifted yourself a subscription? Because that's not what actually happened. But Pizza Guy and Greg Inc. I'm sure will both be very grateful. Thank you, thank you, Jacob Neon. Really appreciate that for your support. Uh, thanks for keeping me here on the air. Yeah. appreciation and gratitude. Thank you very much to the 100 bits. And Golgan. Fierce of jaws of Mesozoic beaked herbivores. Ah. Another touting of carnivore mouths without acknowledging that no one would want to be nailed by, say, a trite's beak flush. Absolutely, Golganak. Holy cow. Spared no expense. And birds are dead on. Dead on gifted a tier one sub to Finch. Thank you, thank you, birds are dead on. A. Birds of a feather. Flock together or subscribe together, it seems. Birds are dead on. Thank you, thank you for your support there. That's wonderful. Appreciate that, Birds are dead on. Good stuff. Yeah. Finch here for Burbs Day. Appreciate yeah, no. Absolutely. Oh, man. It is Thursday, Birds Day, so let's get into talking about this gigantic penguin in a minute here. But yeah, Golganek. Uh, yeah, seriously, some of the most... Crazy, crazy jaws within all of Dinosauria were, um, uh, were among Ornithischia, you know, Ceratopsian dinosaurs, like Triceratops. There's that famous AMNH Triceratops specimen. Look at those jaws right there. I mean, some of you maybe have been unfortunate enough to be bitten by a parakeet or a budgie, or even. Whew, uh, goodness forbid, a, a macaw. Like, they could... A macaw could, like... It could bite your finger off if it really wanted to. They've got pretty formidable beaks. You know, this is an animal, it... Let's protect our fossils. Yeah. If they're removed, America loses them. Forever. And Furuta, thank you for the prime sub there, Furuta. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. I know you only get one of those per month. Thanks for spending it here. Uh, Furuta, I really appreciate that. Yeah. By the way, if anyone here is not, uh, if you don't have $5 to spend for a monthly subscription, but you still want to use those emotes, you still want to be able to watch without ads, you can use your uh, Amazon Prime sub. If you have Amazon Prime, you get one free Twitch sub per month. You could spend it on your favorite live streamer, or you could come here and you could spend it on me. <laughs> on this channel and support science outreach in the pro in the process but uh anyway captain paul afternoon to you too welcome welcome anyway yeah the beaks of uh, ceratopsian dinosaurs pretty incredible um you know this is an animal whose head might be seven feet long including frill uh longer for like more mature triceratops the frill tends to lengthen before it fenestrates but a ceratopsian dinosaur that already has a fenestrated frill, even before that laden ontogeny, is protoceratops. Let me grab my protoceratops skull, and I'll show you the beak on that critter, too. Yeah. 
here we are. Protoceratops. Uh, late Cretaceous. Protoceratopsian. I forget what we call these critters nowadays. Um, but take a look at that beak. Imagine this. This is just the bony core of the rostrum, pre-denary, all that stuff. Imagine if this, like, what it would be like in life. You know, with a sheath of keratin over it. You know, beak material, kind of like your fingernails. Imagine how sharp that would be. Imagine how big those jaw muscles are that are going up here over the jugal, inserting into there. You know, going along here. This thing... This thing could probably snap your femur in half if it really got a good bite in. That's why I'm not necessarily convinced that Ceratopsian dinosaurs... That their horns evolved for defense. I think they're mostly for display. Some of them might have been useful for defense. But I think the primary factor in Ceratopsian horns evolving is for display. These critters had remarkably formidable jaws. Like, a bite from this, and it could be curtains for you, whether you're... Whether you're you, or whether you're a Tyrannosaur, for instance. Um, you do not want to be having a run-in with those chompers there. <sighs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh... Yeah, so I totally agree with you, Golganek. Um, yeah. Uh, Mesozoic beaked herbivores. Those ornithischians, not to be trifled with. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I've been busy too, Captain Paul, I understand, yeah. Faruta says, as a fellow scientist, I'm all about spreading the love. Faruta, if you've told me this already, then I... I apologize. What, uh, what kind of science are you in? Let me know. Yeah. And welcome, fellow scientists. It's great to have you here. I hope you feel right at home. Uh, thank you again for your support with that Prime sub. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Terra says, do you think Ceratopsians could make interesting sounds? Is what we found in Panacosaurus? Oh, no spoilers there, Dr. Terra. Yeah, we'll be talking about that today. And, yeah, I've got no reason to think that they couldn't make interesting sounds. I... Yeah, we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about that. Yeah. Uh... It's time for science, Ash Girl. Science! Science! science. Yes, it is indeed. Yeah. And, uh... No, just new here from last night, actually. Medicine and medical education. Very cool, Furuta. That's awesome. It's great to have you here. Welcome to the community. Yeah. And uh, are we going to see the rest of the things from Lenina's package? We are, Nell. We are. But let's... Uh, let's talk about this giant penguin first. Yeah. Uh, dinosaur deep dive requested by Gimpleg there. Yeah. Ancient penguins would have been an utterly astonishing sight on the beaches of New Zealand, says researcher. Very cool. Oh, and what an appropriate song for this, actually. Shoot, let's start that over. It's monster surfing time. <laughs> yeah! How much does that weigh in gorillas? Ah, says Birds of Dead on. Yeah, you know? Americans will use anything before they use the metric system. Let's talk about kilos here. Uh, nearly 160 kilos, the same as an adult gorilla. Adult male gorilla? Males, there's a lot of sexual dimorphism in gorillas. Males are a lot bigger than females. The fossilized bones of Kumimanu Fordaisai, discovered in 57 million year old beach boulders in North Otago on New Zealand's South Island in 2017. Yeah. Uh, Kumimanu is an ex existing genus. Really? So we already had another species within this genus? Uh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, it's the largest fossil penguin ever discovered at approximately 350 pounds. Holy moly. It would have weighed more than basketball player Shaquille O'Neal at the peak of his dominance. <laughs> uh, yes, when Shaquille O'Neal ruled the Earth. 
uh, it's significantly later than this, but 57 million years ago is a long time ago. That's like early Eocene, I think. Let's look that up on our, uh... Nope. There we go. Uh, let's see... 57 million years ago would be... No, shoot, that's within the Paleocene. That's solidly Paleocene there. That's kind of crazy. Um... Yeah. So, very shortly thereafter, after the, uh, the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, at the end of the Cretaceous period, that asteroid hit 66 million years ago, and, shoot, uh, yeah, 11 million years later, wait, no, hang on, 9 million years later, you've already got gigantic penguins like that running around New Zealand. And gratitude, thank you very much for the 100 bits. And, uh, thank you, Hogan. Now, was this uh, when I saw you started your stream, I had to pop in with that video link. What do you think of their choices? Yeah, I was saying earlier, Hogan, I, uh... Yeah, I don't... I, I also did a list of, I think, my top 22 most interesting dinosaur finds of 2022. I don't think there was a single overlap one. There were so many cool things that came out in the past year. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, and I purposefully avoided that video because I wanted to come up with my own takes, you know? But, uh, so I didn't show it on stream, but... I did, I think... I think I scrubbed through it at one point and took a look. It's a video from SciShow. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, so cool stuff here. Giant penguin there. Thank you for the 100 bits, by the way, Hogan. Appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. How much does that weigh in Shaquille O'Neal's? Roughly one, Birds of Dead On. Yeah. <coughs> uh, excuse me. At least two Emperor Penguins tall? It is indeed, yeah. There's a modern Emperor Penguin there. There is Kumimanu for Daisai. Yeah. Very nice. And there were no cetaceans yet. Or at least there were no... Yeah, in the Paleocene, I don't even think whale ancestors would really come around yet. Um, another good song. Yeah. Uh, and were there any Cretaceous penguins? I don't think there are any Cretaceous penguins, Gimpleg. I think they go back to the Paleocene, but I don't think they were there for the impact. And if you recall correctly, it was the first penguin. Maybe the first that we found so far. Yeah, that penguin would crutch you. <laughs> JMM, I suppose so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty neat. Let's see if we can take a look at the original paper, given this is supposed to be a deep dive. Oh, shoot. It's in Journal of Paleontology. Oh. I guess it is not. Paywalled. Well... You know, we love an open access paper here. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Excuse me. Let's take a look at some of their figures here. Mm -hmm. There's where some of the sites were there. And, yep. Just, like, a lot of the penguin fossils from New Zealand, this was within a big class. It was in, basically, like, a beach boulder. A uh, big stone from the beach. Somebody walking along saw some interesting stuff on the exterior, and then they brought this into the museum, which is pretty neat. Uh, they actually did some 3D scanning like this. Figure out what's going on with that. Very cool. Uh, so that is the humerus. This is the upper arm bone. And using this, they're able to actually figure out how big the critter would have been. I think if we look at this image here, we've got what we call a skeletal, skeletal reconstruction. And so we've got a cervical vert. We've got most of a humerus. One of the sternals, I think. Part of a scap. Got some knee bones. Part of a tibia. So yeah, not a whole lot from this critter, but enough given that we know what penguins look like anatomically. And these are very clearly penguin bones. 
able to basically size that up and figure out how how big it would have been, which is pretty neat. And uh, I like that there's some overlap here. We've got a humerus here, humerus there, cervical vertebrae here, cervical vertebrae there. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyway, let me give you a link to the paper if you would like that. Uh, come on. It's not letting me copy that. I'll give you a link to the page, I suppose. Yeah. And do they get smaller? Because they uh, they lived on islands, says uh, Johnny Boy. Great question, Johnny Boy. Modern penguins, you know, they've kind of spread out from Zealandia to other places. We've got penguins uh, on the southern tip of Africa. We've got penguins in Antarctica. Uh, we've got penguins in Australia. And... Yeah, it doesn't seem to be island dwarfism there. They don't seem to have ensmallened themselves because they're living on small islands with few resources. I'm not really sure why they would have gotten smaller. It's interesting. We've kind of got the opposite of Cope's rule going on here, where all other things being equal, lineages of organisms tend to get larger over time. Penguins, they seem to start off the largest that they ever were. At least the earliest penguins we have so far, also the largest. So I don't really know what's going on there. It's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, they have penguins up north? Not anymore. No, penguins are all southern hemisphere, Filmsy. Yeah. Um, unless you're thinking of the great auk, which is not a penguin. But, uh, yeah. It was once thought to be related to penguins, but no, it's definitely not. Because of gravity? Lol. No, Silverian. Oh. Um. <laughs> no, I don't know why penguins got smaller over time. It's a good question. I don't know enough about this group to really give you a solid answer. I gotta be humble about this, you know? I work on non-avian dinosaurs. But yeah. Yeah. And I'll see you later, uh, Christoph. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Because they stack easier? That's how they stay warm, says Dr. Dumbasaurus? No, actually, being larger helps you stay warmer, because you've got a lower, or a, a higher volume to surface area ratio, the larger you are. So larger animals are able to stay warmer more easily than than smaller animals. More thermal mass. There you go, Iacan. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Maybe the average size of their prey shrank, Furblick? Could be. I don't know. It could also just be... I don't know if we really know who the ancestor of penguins might be, but if these guys evolved from a bird that was very, very large to start with, maybe they've just kind of been on a downward trajectory since. I don't know what the starting point is for penguins, you know? I, I, I don't think we know that, you know? So, yeah. Um... Anyway, and these guys wouldn't have lived in a particularly cold environment either. Zealandia at the time was not... I don't think it was that cold. It's not like modern-day Antarctica. But yeah. We need a penguin paleontologist for this one. There you go, Jody Fish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and hey, Baniarola. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. We have not found the Godzilla-sized penguin fossils yet, says Oliver. Yeah, yes indeed. <laughs> uh, maybe we never will. Although, never say never. Uh, unless you're using the phrase never say never, in which case you have to say the word never. But, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, Lenina. You're here right now, right, Lenina? Uh, maybe I should open up this mysterious and intriguing envelope. Which seems like it might be full of treasure here. There's Lenina. Yes, indeed. Let's go ahead and do this. Oh, man, I'm excited. So, uh, Lenina and Blue sent me a box yesterday with a beautiful plush Komodo dragon in it for Komodo Dragon Day. And that was a gift because 
they, on behalf of me and the rest of this community, adopted a Komodo dragon. You know, let me just show you. I don't know why I'm saying this. Let me go get it. There we go. Yeah. Here in the folder is a certificate of adoption for a Komodo dragon at the Fort Worth Zoo. Lenina and Blue know that I love Komodo dragons, and many people in this community do. And, uh, well, yeah, I don't know, this really, really made me smile. This makes my heart happy. Um, there's the letter there. This is so well organized and packaged, too. Lenina and Blue, that's wonderful. Put it into a folder, you put these into document protectors. There is a lovely card here. Um, Lenina, my goodness, you make me you know, choked up reading that. Thank you. Inside the box also was not only the biggest Ziploc bag I've ever encountered, I think, but a lovely plush Komodo dragon, which at some point, once I figure out how to do this, we will be raffling this off during a fundraiser for Komodo Dragon Conservation. So, uh, stay tuned for that, everybody. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, Kita Nero, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Very excited about this. But that wasn't all in the package. In this box, there's also a mysterious white envelope filled with some kind of bullion or treasure or something. I have a sneaking suspicion as to what this might be. So let's us have a look, shall we? Hmm. Unmarked envelope. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> ah! Yeah. Oh, we've got a bunch of beautiful, I'm assuming pre-1982 copper pennies. Yeah, let's take a look at this one. 1979. Why am I so excited about pennies? You might be wondering. Well, I'll show you why. Pre-1989 copper pennies. 1983? 82? Proper copper pennies from the U.S. Mint uh, are something that's sought after by collectors of pressed pennies. Because they can be used in those penny press machines. You see it like touristy places to create pressed pennies. You can use any kind of penny, but holy cow, the copper ones are really where it's at. And are these from the Fort Worth Zoo? This is beautiful. And there's a Komodo dragon one. Holy moly. We've got four different seropsids here. Beautiful. Holy cow. Take a look at these. Look. So I collect pressed pennies, especially ones that are fossil-related, dinosaur-related, or, you know, any kind of seropsid, really. Uh, turtles, lizards, tuataras, crocodilians, or birds. And beautiful. Is that a... Aladabra tortoise? Very nice. From the Fort Worth Zoo. Beautiful. That's so nice. We've got, like we were talking about yesterday, a King Cobra. Very nice. Oh, this is beautiful. And they're so clean and shiny. Holy cow. We've got... Ooh, an Archosaur here. Is this a saltwater crocodile? Yes, indeed it is. That is gorgeous. Oh man, these are going to be a wonderful part of my collection. I cannot wait to put these in the album. And look, just like 
We were discussing all stream yesterday. Varanus Komodoensis. A Komodo dragon. Absolutely beautiful. This is wonderful, Lenina and Blue. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really appreciate you. I will treasure these. Uh, because these are legit treasure. They really are. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh... And Lenina says, maybe I'm biased, but I think the Fort Worth Zoo has the coolest logo. They definitely do have a cool logo. They really do. With the, uh, the elephant there, forming the F, that's super neat. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Terrace says, Fort Worth Zoo is absolutely huge. I was walking for five hours. They've not finished adding their African Predator section yet. Highly recommend anyone passing by to take a visit. I will have to do that. The... Not the next time I'm in Texas, but the first time I'm in Texas. I've never spent any time in Texas outside of an airport. So yeah, yeah. So thank you, thank you, Lenina and Blue. That is very thoughtful of you. And uh, these are going to make a fine addition to my collection. Yeah. Um, holy cow. There's a bunch of ones from... Uh, yeah, there's... Uh, Great Plains Zoo right there. There's another dinosaur right here. A flaminger. Uh, anyway, Battleship South Dakota. How they got a battleship to South Dakota is... Uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you. But yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, there's some dinosaur-themed ones there. Yeah, beautiful. Very nice. Um, anywho, this is something I will treasure. So thank you, thank you, Lenina and Blue. Very thoughtful of you. Very, very thoughtful. Yeah. And, uh, you rode one of your Harleys across Texas. You've got multiple Harley Davidson motorcycles, Hogan. Holy cow. Yeah. Great snacks in the border. Nice. Yeah. Uh, treasure is an understatement. Thank you, Jody Fish. Yeah. And JMM says, Danny, I'm going to call the T-Rex in the back. Rex, that's not its name, JMM. This is, this is Chomper. Chomper Rex. This is actually based on a, in part, on a specimen I helped dig up uh, with Museum of the Rockies back in 2013, 2014. Um, here, uh... There we go. Yeah. Uh, there he is right there on the left. Chomper. Um, oh, and shoot. There we go. <laughs> Who's this dingus posting about this? My goodness. Yeah. Uh, uh, MOR6625 is the specimen number. Yeah, this is, uh, I should actually email Larry Whitmer about this and see if, if I can get the files to print this. It's a little bit different from, uh, from what you see up here. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, Chomper, it's, it's a funny story, actually. Why it had that name, I'll, I'll tell it sometime. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Cool stuff. And uh, I remember you pressing a penny on one of the museum tours you streamed. Very cool to see the album. Thanks, Lady Lara Croft. Yeah, yeah. That might have been at Museum of the Rockies. Where I, uh, where Chomper... Well, that cast resides, at least. But yeah. Yeah. Uh... Anyway. And Chomper's... Oh, Clearbird, did you find a link? About... Yeah, there you go. This is, uh... Is this Larry Whitmer's... Or is this uh, some sort of Tyrannosaur person, right? Is this Thomas Carr? The, the, the what? The beast. I'm sorry. The beast. Again? The beast. I, I, I... The beast. Say it one more time? I didn't catch that. The, the what? The, the who? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just... Uh, w would you mind saying it again? One more time? The 
I'm sorry, I missed it. <laughs> Cliff Alistair McLean, thank you so much for the 13 months of support. Really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Cliff Alistair McLean. That's, uh... That's wonderful. It really is. 13 months is a long time. That's almost a whole year, isn't it? Thank you, Cliff Alistair McLean, for keeping me online for the past 13 months. It's, that's, I appreciate it. It's a big deal. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who who wrote this? Yep, there's a little chomper right there. Uh, Chomper Rex's tiny reconstructed skull next to a cast of the Burpee Museum's juvenile T-Rex. Jane, for comparison. I saw Jane back in July of 2022. July of last year. Uh, yeah... To date, MOR6625 is the smallest Tyrannosaurus Rex specimen to be studied. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and this is from... Jody Moore? Okay. Not sure I know who that is. About. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. Very cool. Thank you, Claire, for finding that. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyway. I also have another item that I just received today. Um. A truck horn. Are you currently here, a truck horn? If not, we'll wait till you are. But I got something in the mail from a truck horn and uh I'm pretty impressive I kind of put it up on the wish list on a whim I thought I could really use this but I don't know if anybody's gonna uh anybody's actually gonna buy it but yeah uh and Sigourney W says my friend has that generator on your wish list I've used that same generator before too the Honda ones are really good yeah excellent stuff uh, so yeah, we used to use them with Museum of the Rockies for our, uh, our jackhammers, like, uh, during the Yoshi's Trike site excavation, during Overburden for that. We had, uh, one or two of those generators. Yeah. Hmm. I could get kind of a cheapo generator, but I figure it'll make more sense for me to spend a little bit more money and get something that's going to last a lifetime. Be a lot less wasteful than getting a generator that might last for a summer before it breaks down and can't use it anymore and it still costs two-thirds the amount you know so yeah Sigourney we're on the same page there yeah yeah and uh, friendly welcome back good to have you here friendly neighborhood Mexican great to see you yeah and uh Hogan says those Honda generators are fantastic I'm a Honda fanboy they're indestructible as a mechanic I love anything Honda Pretty great. Honda makes wonderful engines, Hogan. They really do. Um, yeah. Well, a Harley guy and a Honda guy. It's interesting, Hogan. That's interesting. <laughs> What's your opinion on Honda's bikes? Um, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. I drive a Toyota myself. You, you really can't go wrong with Toyota or Honda. You know, I'm not... I'm not a mechanic. I don't know enough about this sort of thing, but in my experience, Honda and uh, Toyota pretty bulletproof. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And shout to you too, Esther the Dreamer. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Esther. Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Uh, Honda Civic owner, I love it. They're great cars, Kirsten. They really are. Yeah. CRV's good too. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Anywho, yeah. If a truck horn shows up, uh, you can notify me of this because I have something to show off from a truck horn, but I want to wait till they're here first. So, yeah. Uh, oh, and nice, Hogan, yeah. yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's about time to jump into... Some fossil news here. 
What do you think, everybody? Is it a good time for some fossil news? It's always a good time for some fossil news. All right. Today on Fossil News, our top stories. Spinosaur brains. Studying the endocast, the interior of the brain case of spinosaurids. To figure out what their brains were shaped like. Armored dinosaur vocalizations. We've got a preserved vocal apparatus of Pinacosaurus, really well-known ankylosaur in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, late Cretaceous. And then we've got claw function and use in dinosaurs, too. This I just saw this right before we started the stream. Uh, lots of interesting stuff to discuss. So let's get into it. First off, news release, 13th of February, 2023. We've been so busy with other stuff this week, I haven't had a chance to get to this. You know, we had Valendino's Day, Komodo Dragons yesterday. Now it's time for Fossil News. Oldest Spinosaur Brains Revealed Researchers from the University of Southampton and Ohio University have reconstructed the brains and inner ears of two British Spinosaurs, helping uncover how these large predatory dinosaurs interacted with their environment. As a background for anybody who might not be familiar with Spinosaurs, let me introduce you to one of the coolest groups of theropods, in my opinion. But of course, I'm very biased in favor of Spinosaurs, because that's a group that I'm currently working on. Man, i got to get that paper submitted soon. But here is a 3D print. Oh, and thank you, Hogan. Truckhorn is here. Oh, that's brilliant. Here, we'll put Spinosaurs on hold for just a minute here. Uh... And somebody's calling me. Hang on. Who's calling me? Like a spam call. Uh. Anyway, yeah. Truckhorn, welcome back. It's good to have you here. <laughs> and Truckhorn, you'll never guess what popped up in the mail. My uh, fifty thousand a year has been well spent. Wait, and holy cow! Now tier three there. There's just one distraction after another. But Nell, thank you so much for the three months at tier three. After having been subscribed for eight months, this is confusing to me, but Nell, a tier three is pretty extraordinary. Oh, baby, a triple! Oh, yeah! <laughs> Nell, that's incredible. Thank you, thank you. Um, really amazing. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway, uh... A truck horn. You are here, right? Are you listening? Yeah, a truck horn. Beautiful. Um... Well, I... Actually, I'd like some confirmation. Maybe a truck horn might be lurking. I want them to see this. Because it was pretty extraordinary. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh... Let me talk about Spinosaurus for a minute until we can confirm that Truckhorn is indeed watching. Uh... This, ladies and gentlemen, is a Spinosaurid. This is Baryonyx. I actually sculpted this digitally and then 3D printed it. This is the group of dinosaurs that I'm working on right now. Spinosaurids are really, really interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, for, oh. Okay, Truckhorn. <laughs> Get back to Spinosaurids in a second. But Truckhorn, I wanted to thank you so much. Holy moly. For this, 
Holy cow, Truckhorn. I put this on the Amazon wish list a while ago. Last summer when I was out in the field, uh, you know, digging up an Iguanodontian with my crew, um, we had a, a serious dearth of tunes. You know, I can't play my ukulele when I'm digging. And I had a Bluetooth speaker with me, but... I don't know. My phone didn't have any reception. I don't really have a music app on my phone anyway. It didn't have any music. And music, as anybody who's dug up dinosaurs with a good crew in the past can tell you, music can be really helpful. So I realized, hey, I could try and find a little MP3 player. You know, something pretty basic, fairly inexpensive. Put that up on the wish list. It's just like $40, $30, something like that. A truck horn. Got it, like, right away. I it's It's like shortly after I put this up there. Suddenly, poof, it's gone off the wish list. And a truck horn purchased it. Here is the message right there. <laughs> truck horn, thank you so, so much. Um, beautiful. Yeah. May your paleontological adventures be groovy and well labeled. Rock on, cowboy, from. A truck horn. Thank you. Thank you, truck horn. Seriously. Pretty extraordinary. I cannot wait to learn how this works and to load it up with a bunch of tunes. I and the rest of the members of my crew, I think, will will be very, very grateful to be able to have music in the field, truck horn. Um, so thank you. And... Those of you watching, when I do live streams from the field, provided that works, cross your fingers, um, you'll probably be, be able to enjoy some of the tunes, too, playing through the speakers. So, uh, so thank you, thank you, Truckhorn. It really means a lot to me. And, uh, you sent Sharpies, too, because I thought they would be packed together. <laughs> I think the Sharpies have been delayed. That, okay, that makes sense. Well-labeled. I thought maybe well-labeled was in reference to... The songs having proper metadata or something like that. Anyway, Truckhorn, thank you for sending Sharpies, too. I can't wait till those arrive. Those are useful for all kinds of different things in the field, so... Yeah. Yeah. And uh, surf rock music goes really well with digging dinosaurs up, I'm sure. It certainly can, Triceratops. It certainly can. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you, thank you, Truckhorn. It means a lot to me. Um, and you get so much... So much good use out of that. Um, that's going to be wonderful. Yeah. And uh, Sigourney says, What program do you use to 3D sculpt with? I think I have a command for that. Hang on. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Sculptress. Which is... I don't even know if you can find it anymore. It was a freeware program. Um, can I use it to... Uh... Sculpt this. I do pretty much all my sculpting in Sculptress. I bet you you could. You might have to use like the Wayback Machine to find it or something. I don't know. Um, that even, it's even possible. Oh, I've got a gnat. I don't know where it went. Anyway, Godspeed, little gnat. I hope you uh, find a safe place to fly around. But yeah, Sculptress. You've probably heard of ZBrush, the professional sculpting software that, like, all the pros use. Uh, Sculptress is made by the same company uh, called Pixelogic. It was made by the same company, Pixelogic. But, um... Uh, basically, if ZBrush is like Adobe Photoshop, you know, very feature-rich, like, just, it would take... You'll, you'll never learn all the features, it's just crazy. Then Sculptress is like Microsoft Paint. Very stripped down, very basic, but if you know how to use it well, you can get the job done. I've seen people do amazing work in Microsoft Paint, believe it or not. Um, so it's a more crude tool, but it's a lot easier to use, honestly. It's easier to figure out. So Sculptress is what I use for stuff like this. This, again, is Baryonyx, a Spinosaurid from the early Cretaceous of England. 
Spinosaurus, or excuse me, Baryonyx is a kind of Spinosaur. These dinosaurs are characterized by big, beefy forelimbs with huge claws on them. Um, fairly straight necks right here. They don't have a lot of curvature to their neck. And they've got these long, slim, crocodile-like jaws like this. These dinosaurs, we have multiple lines of evidence showing that they were fish eaters. They were piscivorous. They made their living, it seems, eating fish. Out of deltas, rivers, lakes, marshes. Um, yeah, pretty cool animals. Uh, Spinosaurids really, really neat. I've got a paper coming out, hopefully sometime soon. i got to get it submitted. About uh, inferred behavior of Spinosaurids based on their anatomy. Um, this new paper right here takes a look at their brains. This drawer contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of Troodon. Eagly, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If we want to figure out what these animals were like, how they're making a living in their environment, how they're behaving, we want to get a better sense for them as living animals. One of the best things we can do is look at their brains. When you look at the brain of an animal, even if it's just what we call an endocast, you know, even if it's just like the shape of the interior of the brain case, that gives you a good sense for what the shape of the brain would be. And certain parts of the brain being larger than others, you can kind of show that, yeah, these animals are focused on this sort of behavior. They had a very good sense of smell because they had large olfactory bulbs or huge optic nerves for big eyes, that kind of thing, you know? Uh, you know, brains are important to an animal. They're important to dinosaurs, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, like I was telling you about spinosaurs, crocodile-like jaws, conical teeth, uh, helped them live a somewhat aquatic lifestyle that involved stalking riverbanks in the quest of prey, among which were large fish. This way of life was very different from the more familiar theropods, like Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. I kind of wonder whether it actually was all that different. And this paper shows, like, it... May not have been as different as we might imagine. Uh, so yeah, to better understand the evolution of Spinosaur brains and senses, the team scanned fossils of Baryonyx from Surrey and Ceratosuchops from the Isle of Wight. Yeah, anyway, Ceratosuchops. The two are the oldest Spinosaurs for which brain case material is known. The huge creatures would have been roaming the planet about 125 million years ago. The brain cases of both specimens are well preserved and the team digitally reconstructed the internal soft tissues that had long rotted away. That's the thing, is the brain itself is not going to be preserved. Brains... Hopefully nobody here knows this firsthand through personal experience, but brains are pretty squishy, you know? I hope you've never had to poke your own brain. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're pretty squishy not a good candidate for fossilization, but what is is a skull. And skulls tend to have, like, a full enclosure around the brain. We call that a brain case. And so it's... Yeah, you open up the brain case and you've got basically the you know, the structure of the brain preserved in that. You know? Because um, generally there's not a lot of wiggle room between the brain and the brain case. So yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Dr. Terra says, I thought Ceratosuchops was more in the Suchomimus family. Yeah, they're both Spinosaurids, Dr. Terra. They're, they're both Baryonychine Spinosaurids, I should say. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, you know a lot of people whose brains have rotted away? Yeah, sometimes it happens pre-mortem, Hogan. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. And uh, Orca Strand says, in the future, what do you think a paleontologist will make of our human brain? I don't know. <sighs> will we have paleontologists in the future? After humans? I don't know. 
uh, they'll probably say, what a big, wasteful organ. What extravagant, decadent creatures would have this big, thirsty brain like this, you know, requiring so much, so many resources. Uh, what an incredibly poorly designed creature. No wonder they went extinct, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Seems only to have been there to support the face, says Claire Burr. Maybe they'll think like the ancient Egyptians did. Oh, yeah. What an enormous organ for producing snot. Because apparently ancient Egyptians... At least, I don't know, we should ask Melissa in denial about this. There's that old idea that, like, oh, in ancient Egypt, they didn't realize that the brain was responsible for thought. Or for, you know, uh, automatic functions like heartbeat and stuff like that. And breathing. Um... You know, they thought all that stuff was, uh, you know, they thought you, you would think with your heart. They basically thought everything up here was just junk. It's like, yeah, that produced snot. Um, I don't know if that's true. And also, ancient Egypt, man, that's a, a long time by human standards. Literally thousands of years. Um, what's the old saying, too, that, uh, Cleopatra was, uh, closer in time to the opening of Epcot Center than she was to the building of the Great Pyramids. Um, or yeah, uh, yeah, you could put it like this. Cleopatra. Cleopatra lived closer in time to the opening of the Bass Pro Shops Pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee than she did to the construction of the Great Pyramid at Giza. So yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and the Aztecs and Mayans knew that the head was related to thought, so I'd take that with a pinch of salt. Yeah, you're probably right, Rehabophion, yeah. Yeah. Thought the brain was used to cool down the blood or something, Layer <laughs> T. Uh, the Luxor in Vegas. There you go, Ash Girl. Yeah, that too. Um, anyway, good stuff. Spinosaur brains. Very important for Spinosaur dinosaurs. Uh, so yeah. The researchers found the olfactory bulbs, which process smells, weren't particularly developed, and the ear was probably attuned to low-frequency sounds. It's so cool that we can actually figure that out just by looking at the structure of the brain. Those parts of the brain involved in keeping the head stable and the gaze fixed on prey were possibly less developed than they were in later, more specialized Spinosaurs. Uh, findings are due to be published in the Journal of Anatomy. Despite their unusual ecology, it seems the brains and senses of these early spinosaurs retained many aspects in common with other large-bodied theropods. There is no evidence that their semi-aquatic lifestyles are reflected in the way their brains are organized, said University of Southampton PhD student Chris Barker, who led the study. Very cool. It's really interesting to think about, because... Uh, yeah, let me find you a clip of Baryonyx here. Hmm. Uh, that should be... Baryonyx, Baryonyx. Um... Shoot, where did that go? Lytosaurus, Megalosaurus. We'll be talking about Megalosaurus extensively on Monday, everybody. Where's our Baryonyx? Uh, Tyrannosaurus. Weird. It's not showing up there. Um, promise this will be worth it. Nifty little sequence with Baryonyx in it. Uh, Baryonyx, possibly the best-known dinosaur from England, apart from maybe Scolidosaurus. Best known in terms of uh, amount of material that we have preserved. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. 
Hopefully YouTube doesn't throw a fit about this going up in the VOD later. In the center of Britain's dinosaur research, paleontologists here face the challenge of unraveling jumbled masses of bone to build a picture of a living, breathing dinosaur. Hmm. 32 years ago, an amateur fossil hunter found something extraordinary in a Surrey clay pit that yep. will become known as the find of the century. Hmm. And this is what he discovered. Yeah. Nothing <laughs> like this enormous claw had ever been seen in the world before. Scientists from the museum returned to the site and uncovered almost half a complete skeleton, enough to fill three vans. The creature had a curious long skull with mm -hmm. ferocious teeth. It was obviously some kind of new flesh-eating dinosaur, the largest ever discovered in Europe. But what was it, and why did it look so different from other meat-eaters? The first tangible clue was this tiny fossil found in the dinosaur's rib cage. Yeah, I shockwave through the scientific community. It was Did it though? I don't know. Fish scale. And closer inspection <laughs> revealed that it was partially corroded by I, I think that's really funny. Shockwaves through the scientific community. It's like, you know, there's a lot of scientists in the world and not everybody pays attention to dinosaurs. <laughs> As a dinosaur paleontologist, I got to keep myself honest about that, you know? Um, not everybody cares as much about dinosaurs as I do, you know? I doubt that many physicists were like, oh, I feel shockwaves through the community because someone found a fish scale within a theropod dinosaur's ribcage, you know? But yeah, yeah. Acid. Stomach acid. So this fearsome claw belonged to a 33-foot-long killing machine the world's first fish-eating dinosaur, Baryonyx. Yep. <laughs> Baryonyx stalked the swamps and rivers of what is now southern England 125 yeah. million years ago. And we've got Baryonyx emotes here, which if you would like to subscribe... Searching for clues on how Baryonyx hunted, you Professor can use those. Henry Rayfield uses a CT scanner to x-ray its skull. Yeah. I was this really interested in looking at the mechanics of the skull uh, to see how it functioned and how it captured its prey. So one of the really good things about the CT scans is that it allows us to look inside the animal's skull. Hmm. This is a CT scan of the front end of the snout. Very the cool. That you can see have got really, really deep roots. And in the front of the snout, they go almost up to the roof. They're incredibly deep. They're very long teeth and they're really embedded into the jaws. Hmm. <laughs> this little interludes. Oh, basically all the way up uh, to here. Um, means that it will be a very secure tooth, and very good for grabbing and holding onto things. A very slippery, wriggling fish. Indeed, yeah. Barbacoa. There you go, Jody Fish, yes. <laughs> it's estimated Baryonyx needed to hunt down 60 pounds of fish a day in order to survive. The equivalent wow. of nearly a thousand fish fingers. Imagine spending 60 pounds on fish every day. It's a fortune. The fish they were hunting were sizable, weren't they? These were big fish, yeah. So they were up to like two meters or more. So they were pretty sizable. Some of them. They're not the kind of tiddly little fish that you might think of living in rivers in the modern day Surrey or whatever. These were pretty big fish. <laughs> the coelacanth there. Now this is a, the thumb claw of Marionyx. Yep. This claw was used like a hook prey out of the water, so fish, for example. In a similar way that you see things like grizzly bears in modern day environments actually do that with salmon. Yeah, no, actually. But um, anyway, I can't say too much about that because it's not my pub paper's not published yet. There's that claw, Baryonyx, right here. This is a 3D print of the Baryonyx manual ungual. Big thumb claw from this critter. Uh, pretty extraordinary. In almost all dinosaurs, the the thumb claw is the biggest. Um, whether you're talking about uh, you know Tyrannosaurus, Mononychus, Allosaurus, or Baryonyx, the thumb claw is usually the biggest one. So uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, pretty cool, right? And so people are in chat are saying that this is pretty big. No, I mean, it would have been significantly larger 
in life. Because this is just the bony core of the claw right here. The, you know, in life, it would be covered by a keratin sheath that would significantly lengthen it. So you see this right here? There's kind of a groove running down it right there. So that is what we call a nutrient groove, or sometimes called a blood groove. So over the bony part of the claw, there's blood vessels that would go through here. I guess this is like the quick on a, a cat's claw, maybe? You never want to cut a, trim a cat's claw too short because it'll actually start bleeding. Because you're like cutting into the blood groove there. Um, yeah, yeah. So anyway, this would have supported a keratin sheath. Keratin is the material like your fingernails. Would have extended even longer, so it would have been significantly longer and sharper in life. Uh, pretty cool. Pretty cool. It's, uh... <laughs> what a neat animal. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And mammals all have quicks. It's true now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jody Fish says, imagine the scratching post. You need to keep it happy with its claws. Yeah, Jody Fish. Holy moly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh boy. And be careful they don't get into your museum, start scratching around. This claw was used like a hook of prey out of the water. So fish, for example, in a similar way that you see oh. things like grizzly bears in modern day environments actually do that with salmon. Yeah. Fish wouldn't stand a chance against that, would it? It's incredible. It really is mind blowing to imagine such a ferocious predator at large in Southern England. When it was discovered, there was really nothing else like it at all. It really gave us an insight into a completely new group of dinosaurs that we knew nothing about prior to its discovery. You can't forget that these were once living, breathing animals. Yeah. And, friends, I'm not sure that... Uh, I think that might be a kind of a peculiar activity to cats, like having to scratch stuff all the time in order to keep their claws sharpened, right? Uh... I don't know. Do birds do that? Do they have to constantly scratch at things? Like, do they have an instinct to do that? Do, I don't know, other kinds of mammals have that instinct? Do, I don't know, other kinds of mammals that have long claws? I, I kind of wonder about that. I don't know. That seems like kind of a cat thing, you know? Um, but um, I don't know for sure. Yeah. How does it trip on the cord like that? How does he even notice the cord there? Oh boy. There's Dippy the Diplodocus, whom we were talking about earlier this week. Yeah. Baryonyx was a two ton Terminator, always on the lookout for its next meal. <laughs> yeah, Dippy, there you go, Orchestran. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And PX Sharon, that makes a lot of sense. Cats spend most of their time with their claws retracted, so they don't grind down when they're walking. That does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And there you go, Chappy Jenkins. I would think so. Yeah. So dramatic. <laughs> 125 million years ago, Baryonyx would have hunted in a Tower very Bridge. different environment to modern-day London. Britain was much closer to the equator, and the south was a steamy, tropical wetland of rivers and lakes. Baryonyx wasn't a fussy eater. Alongside the fish scales found in its stomach were the remains of another dinosaur, thought to be a baby iguanodon. I do kind of wonder whether all that stuff really was stomach contents, including the fish scales, but... Yeah. You get stuff bunched up like that in fluvial and lacustrine environments. <laughs> its long snout was lined with 96 serrated teeth, more than the mighty T-Rex. Spinosaurus do have a lot of teeth. Yeah. Like a crocodile. Teeth are smaller though. Could breathe through its nostrils while its head was in the water, just waiting to pounce on its prey. 
This powerful predator used its enormous <laughs> razor sharp claws to oh, boy. in the water. That actually is a really lovely depiction. You don't often see their you know how narrow their snouts are like this. I really love that part. That's really cool. Um how good is the model? The model's not bad now. I would make a few changes to it, but uh it's more the behavior that needs working on. Yeah. Which again, I can't necessarily in talk about right now. Lakes of dinosaur Britain, Baryonyx was the ultimate hunter. Yeah, very cool stuff. Baryonyx. Now you've got a picture of what Baryonyx is like. We should have done this before we even started into the uh, uh, the paper here. But yeah. And uh, because the skulls of all Spinosaurs are so specialized for fish catching, it's surprising to see that such non-specialized brains, said contributing author Darren Nash. Uh, but the results are still significant. It's exciting to get so much information on sensory abilities, on hearing, sense of smell, balance, and so on from British dinosaurs. Using cutting-edge technology, we basically obtained all the brain-related information we possibly could from these fossils, uh, Darren Nash said. Uh, very, very cool. Yeah. This new research is just the latest in what amounts to a revolution in paleontology due to advances in CT imaging of fossils, said Larry Whitmer. Larry Whitmer made the uh, Chomper Rex model that we were looking at earlier. Uh, yeah, he does a ton of CT scanning and reconstructions of soft tissue based on that. Yeah. Uh, who's been CT scanning dinosaurs, including baryonyx, for over 25 years. We're now in a position to be able to assess the cognitive and sensory abilities of extinct animals and explore how the brain evolved in behaviorally extreme dinosaurs like Spinosaurus. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Oh, yeah. And, uh... Derp. That's not what we're trying to find. Is... Uh, published in the Journal of Anatomy. Yeah. After the embargo has lifted. This is just the press release here, but here we go. Yeah. And here is the PDF open access. You gotta love that. Yeah. Beautiful. Here, give me just a second, and then uh, we will take a look at this. There we go, yeah. Modified skulls, but conservative brains? The paleoneurology and endocranial anatomy of baryonychine dinosaurs. Very cool. Very cool. Excuse me. Uh, given the morphological similarities observed in other basal tetanurans, baryonychines likely possessed comparable behavioral sophistication, suggesting the transition from terrestrial hypercarnivores ancestors to semi-aquatic generalists during the evolution of Spinosauridae did not require substantial modification of the brain and sensory systems. This kind of goes along with one of the things that I say in uh, in the paper on Spinosaurids that I'm working on with a co-author. It seems like the, the general body plan of theropod dinosaurs... Nope. Here. Uh, theropod dinosaurs are these guys. Two-legged, mostly meat-eating dinosaurs. And having, you know, walking on two legs like that, as they did, uh, freed up their forelimbs to do all kinds of really interesting stuff. They could do all kinds of cool things with their arms, that other dinosaurs who were quadrupedal could not do. And so it allows them to become really interesting and specialized like that while still kind of retaining the overall theropod body plan. So the very largest of the theropods are critters like uh, 
Spinosaurus or Giganotosaurus right here. Absolutely huge hyper carnivorous dinosaurs here. This is a theropod. This also is a theropod. Right here. The theropod body plan is just remarkably versatile. You know? You could be a 40 or 50 foot long hyper carnivore, or you could be a little super fast, tiny, hyper small critter that, you know, is in competition with insects in its niche. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. The theropod body plan is extremely versatile. And it's not surprising that they also found that here, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, the transition from terrestrial hypercarnivorous ancestors to semi-aquatic generalists during the evolution of Spinosauridae did not require substantial modification of the brain and sensory systems. Theropods are remarkably versatile, it seems. And that apparently also extends to their brains to a certain extent. Which is really neat. Um... And there you have an endocast of, uh, is this from Baryonyx? I think it probably is. Yeah. Yep, cranial endocast of Baryonyx walkery. Reconstructed from CT scans. So it actually looks kind of, it does look pretty different from our Tyrannosaurus. Because it's just shorter. We don't have that huge olfactory center in it. So, Tyrannosaurus, T-Rex, would have had a much more keen sense of smell than, say, uh... Dig up, dig up dinosaurs? <laughs> well... Try to. Andrew Try to, Holden, yeah. Five raiders want to know what it's like. Andrew Holding, thank you for the raid, and welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? And how was your stream? I hope it was really good. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Doing something called Blackwell Unbound. I hope it was fun, Andrew. Great to have you here. Matt Trumpets, how are you doing? Great. Glad you could make it. For anybody who's just tuning in, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I... I don't know. You'd probably know this already, but a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaurs in particular. I dig up dinosaurs with various museums here in the US. I study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature, and these days I stream about dinosaurs five days a week. This is how I do my science outreach. How I make my living too, believe it or not. So welcome, welcome, if anybody's here for the first time. Glad you could make it. Uh, anyway, thank you, thank you, Andrew Holding for your raid. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad you had a good stream. Uh, let's see. We worked out how many sausages fit in the sun. More than five, I would guess. It was a lot. Okay. <laughs> what? Yeah. It would depend on the size of the sausage, I suppose. Uh, even at your variables. Yeah. Brannington 3. How are you doing, Brannington the 3rd? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, the rules, yeah. One, two, three, many. Yeah, exactly, Brannington. <laughs> one centimeter by one centimeter by ten centimeters. Those are some very slim, long sausages, Andrew Holding. Interesting. Hmm. So, yeah. And, uh... And pragmatic entropy. Do we have different audio levels? Between this camera here and this camera here? Oop. They shouldn't be that different, right? Hmm. I will have to look into that. Actually, you know what? Give me a second here. Uh, let's see. Copy. Move. 
paste. Okay, that one should be identical now. And let's take our boom mic. Copy. Okay. Should be identical now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, and Pragmatic Entropy? No, I, I appreciate you. I just copied and pasted the sources. That should also... It should make sure that the filters are identical, too. So, hopefully we're, uh... We're consistent now. Between here and here. Between here... And here. Oh, yeah. Uh, good stuff. Yeah. We are? Thanks, Claire. Beautiful. But anyway, Spinosaurus Braids. Really interesting stuff. Interesting stuff, indeed. Yeah. But clear now? Thank you, Pragmatic Entropy. I appreciate your feedback. As, shoot, as an audio engineer. Telecom engineer, rather. Appreciate you, Pragmatic. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. Uh, this is a paper that I'm going to have to cite in my manuscript. Got to make some more changes to the manuscript here. And, uh... Yeah. Cranial Indicus of Saratosuka. It does appear to be different from that of Baryonyx in some ways, but I wonder how much of that is preservational differences. Like, we're missing the front half. We're missing the olfactory bulbs, right? But they, they do look pretty similar. I don't know. I'd love to know how much Tyrannosaurus brains change over time. I've suspected that Ceratosuchops and Baryonyx might well be, if not the same species of Spinosaurid, they might represent two different members of the same lineage. So basically the same population evolving over time. And I don't know, just I don't know a great deal about brain structure, but I'm not seeing anything that would contradict that idea here. Uh, these being ontogeomorphs or members of the same lineage. Um, I don't know, but I, don't, I honestly really don't know what I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. I will see you next time, Andrew Holding. Thank you. Thank you for bringing your raiders here. And, uh, yeah. Have a great rest of your, uh, great rest of your day. Or evening, because it's late there. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew Holding. I'll see you around. Yeah. So, very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Let's see what, uh, what Darren Nash actually had to say about that. Um, because I do believe he was posting about this on the bird website. There we go. We looked at his Twitter yesterday when we were talking about Yoshi's trike. This is a plastic model based on a specimen of Triceratops I helped excavate back in 2011 with Museum of the Rockies. And, uh, yeah... Uh, Dr. Nish was pretty excited about that, which is cool. Um, but yeah. There we go. He says, today, see the publication of the latest in our group studies of Wielden Spinosaurid dinosaurs. As published in the Journal of Anatomy, we generated and studied digital brain endocast of British baryonychine specimens. Here's a brief thread on the research and our conclusions. Yeah. And Rehabophion, I don't know much about that, no. White Rock Spinosaurid, that's another thing I've got to incorporate in my manuscript. I don't know much about that. Yeah. Uh, very cool. We CT scanned, and there is the University of Southampton CT scanner. X-rays on. <laughs> Glad he included those. Yeah, there's those brain endocasts. Very neat. Uh, the first yet generated for Baryonychines. We tried to scan the holotype of the second Isle of Wight Baryonychine, Riparo Venator, but it proved too full of opaque material 
And the results weren't good. Interesting. Yeah. And the brains of Baryonyx and Stratosucops are different in many respects, he says. Although, how much do dinosaur brains vary during ontogeny and within the same lineage? It's consistent with our hypothesis that they're distinct taxa. However, data are limited on neurocranial variation in dinosaurs, ontogeny. so we can't rule out other explanations for this like ontogeny. There you go. Uh, Lenina, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, typical Mesozoic theropod features. Yep. Uh, our conclusion is that the brains are similar overall to those of other theropods like Allosauroids, including conserv indicating conservatism in brain anatomy despite the very unusual Baryonychian skull. That's a bit of a surprise. And these guys are fairly different from other theropods in terms of their anatomy, but their brains are not that different. So whatever they're doing is not... It's maybe not as different as you might suspect, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How big are the arms on Baryonyx? With the long claws, they may have been doing something like spear fishing. Or a good twilight. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. They're pretty long. They are pretty long. On, uh, Spinosaurids. Yeah. Uh, we use the data to estimate intelligence and sensory abilities. Take home is that Baryonychians don't appear, as far as we can tell, unusual in endocranial anatomy. Though what this means is open to several interpretations. Yeah. And, uh... It's got a blog post about this, too. Cool stuff. We're not going to dwell on it too, too much. Uh, but man, there is that brain case. The occipital condyle... Uh, back of the skull here. Very nice. Yeah. Very cool. I am excited to read this off stream. Very nice indeed. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. European theropods are built different, says Rabophion. I mean, Spinosaurids are. Spinosaurids aren't just European. They're South American. They're African. They're Asian. There's even evidence of maybe a, an Australian Spinosaurid. They're pretty much everywhere except Antarctica and North America. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is an Asaurus. Oh, cool, Hugin. Very nice. Yeah, tell us about that. Anyway, cool stuff. Spinosaurids. It's, again, I've got to modify my <laughs> manuscript even further. Um, so I can get that thing submitted. Incorporating some uh, new information there. Hmm. Next up, in terms of our fossil news. Yeah... The Call of the Wild Ankylosaur. This is going to be exciting stuff. Yeah. And what about New Zealand with three question marks, Gaza? No. I don't, I don't know if we actually have any dinosaurs described from New Zealand yet, Gaza. N no non-avian dinosaurs. Or at least we didn't when I was a kid. Um, yeah. The last time I checked, really. But yeah, yeah. Not a lot of dinosaur fossils from New Zealand yet. But yeah. Yeah. And tenkylosaur noises? Neat. Yes, indeed, PX Sharon. First off, let me introduce to you... Ankylosaurids. Let me think. What's a good depiction of ankylosaurids? Oh, boy. It's hard to come up with one. And Kylosaurids have not really shown up in many, like, dinosaur documentaries. I could show the Walking with Dinosaurs one, but YouTube would throw a fit about that showing up in the VOD. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. This is going to be tricky. 
And Kylosaurids do not get enough attention. And, uh... Yeah, in like... Here we go. We'll try this. <laughs> oh, boy. This might be lousy. Let's see here. There's an Ankylosaur. Yeah, this is going to be pretty similar to... That does not look like Ankylosaurus. That's a garbage Ankylosaurus. Oh, boy. Um. Uh, yeah. And then we've got a Tyrannosaur, Tarbosaurus. Tarbosaurus and Ankylosaurus never would have met each other. These animals lived at different times and in different places. Ankylosaurus in North America. Tarbosaurus in Asia. Tarbosaurus is what, like, earliest Mastrictian or, um, latest Campanian? Ankylosaurus is Mastrictian. But anyway, this is an Ankylosaur right here. And yeah, these are, uh, this is pretty goofy. No. Oh boy. Anyway. Ankylosaurs. Four legged armored dinosaurs. The Ankylosaurids among Ankylosauria. They've got that big tail club. Uh, the dinosaur we're going to be looking at in particular is called Pinacosaurus. Well known from Mongolia. This is probably the best known Ankylosaur. One of the best known Ankylosaurs in the world, if not the most known Ankylosaurid. Yeah. Uh, name means Plank Lizard. Uh, lived during the Campanian, Mongolian, China. At least 24 Pinacosaur skeletons have been found, possibly more than any other Ankylosaur. These predominantly consist of juveniles. Adult fossils have not been found in groups. Interesting. Uh, so yeah. Pretty cool critter. It's basically like a huge armored coffee table with a big deadly club at the end of its tail. Again, let's scoot this this way so you can see that club. Yeah. Still can't see it. But anyway. Pinacosaurus. Cool critter. And that's that's a pretty decent reconstruction right there. I like that. Not the sort of animal you want to mess with, honestly. You know? But yeah. And they're from Mongolia? Yeah. But, uh, there are so many dinosaurs from Mongolia, Iron Man. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and Furbly, yeah, prehistoric plant. That's taken from Walking with Dinosaurs. That would get flagged by YouTube, unfortunately. But yeah. Yeah. Do not try to balance your coffee on them. Yes, Mayor Space. They will not be kind to your, uh, to your coffee mugs or your coffee cakes. Yeah. It was the Honda Scooter of its day? What do you mean, Orchid Twilight? What? Are Honda Scooters very low slung and extremely wide? This is an animal that's like, it's super, super wide. Um. Yeah. They're, um. If I could get you a, a top down view of this critter, they're wide boys and gals. Pinacosaurus is, uh. Yeah. Uh, there's a PNSO Pinacosaurus figure. Very cool. Maybe we can find a video on that. Maybe somebody reviewing that and they'll turn it over and you can see, get a good sense for how wide this critter is. Um, Pinacosaurus. There we go. Yeah. From Dan's Dinosaurs. Yeah. I like that it's, uh... It's colored here like a thorny devil. Kind of similar coloration. That's clearly where they drew inspiration from. Yeah. Yep, there's a thorny devil right there. Good stuff. Look how wide this critter is. Holy moly. Pretty wide. 
I mean, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> and Kylots are tipping not a thing. Yeah, holy cow, you would uh you wouldn't have shins anymore. Is it in the microwave? No, Mayor Space. <laughs> uh and they did paint it like a mo like exactly PX Sharon, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, what a neat critter. And this is an excellent, excellent model. So now you've got a good sense for what Pinacosaurus would look like. Let's talk about this new paper here. There we go. An Ankylosaur larynx provides insight for bird-like vocalization and non-avian dinosaurs. This is luckily an open access paper. Yes, indeed. Uh, here is a copy of that link in the chat there. Yeah. You could have a picnic on its back if it wasn't so spiky. I suppose green herring, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and... Let's see if we have any news releases about this. Um, Pinacosaurus. Nope, that's the same one. Uh, we were just on this page. Yep. It really hasn't, uh... Hasn't made mainstream news yet, but here's the original scientific paper. Let's take a look at it, given that it is open access, which... You know we love. An FMSSK? The dinosaur had an angelic voice? Well, I happen to have... A sound recording right here. Let's hear what it would have sounded like. Wow. Can you believe that? Holy cow. Yeah. No. Um. <laughs> no, what's cool is that uh, these critters would have been able to vocalize. We can't exactly tell exactly what they would sound like, but we know that they were capable of, capable of vocalizations, which... There are... There's an old hypothesis. What was it? The silent dinosaur hypothesis? Uh... Yeah... Uh-huh. Uh... Yeah... Let's see. In Phil Center's section on birds and their ancestors, Center makes the bold suggestion that non-avian dinosaurs may have been, yikes, entirely non-vocal. In other words, this posits that dinosaurs may, it may have not only been much quieter than their pop culture counterparts, but actually reliant on non-vocal acoustics when they wanted to communicate audibly. This notion, which I'm calling the silent dinosaur hypothesis, gained a fair bit of discussion online when the first published, when first published and still crops up in modern conservation conversations about dinosaur behavior. Um, anyway, I don't know if anybody actually thinks that dinosaurs were non-vocal, non-avian dinosaurs, but, uh, this should put the final nail into that coffin, you know? Yeah. Uh, so going into the actual paper here, and by the way, can I say how cool it is that this is open access, and, uh, you can actually read it for yourself? Again, here is that link in the chat. This is not science that you hear on, like, you know, morning drive time radio. This is not science, you know, editorialized on the news or something like that. This is, this is the actual scientific paper right here. As scientists, when we publish findings, this is how we do it in scientific journals. This is straight from the science horse's mouth, so to speak. And uh, I'm so glad to be able to share this with you, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and Jody Fish, this is true. Within the EPB, the extent phylogenetic bracket, crocodilians and birds, vocal critters, you're right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Mayor Space says, I think it would be hard to reconstruct a dinosaur's call. Just having the vocal organ is not enough. Can a computer replicate human speech if you give it the shape of our larynx? Yeah, maybe chat GPT could, Mayor Space. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's look into the article. Uh, a hyo -lar laryngeal apparatus, tongue and voice box, is a key evolutionary trait in tetrapods and is as associated with their feeding, respiration, and vocalization. Particularly the larynx, is an entrance to the tracheal passage and is involved in vocalization, e.g. sound communication. Uh, among modern archosaurs, the hyolaryngeal hyo apparatuses of crocodilians and birds differ both anatomically and functionally. In crocodilians, the larynx produces sounds as a vocal source. In birds, the syrinx produces sound at the posterior end of the trachea and then increases vocal efficiency as a vocal source well, the larynx functions as part of the vocal tract. Uh, yeah. Here we examine the hyolaryngeal apparatus of Pinacosaurus and provide the first description of the larynx and non-avian dinosaurs with its comparisons to modern reptiles and birds. Very cool that we actually have that. And so many of these fossil specimens from Mongolia are so beautifully preserved that you actually have stuff like... Holy cow, is that the hyoid in there? RCB. RCB, what is that? Uh, holy moly. Yeah, we've got these little spindly bones from down in the throat. That's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Very cool. And there's Pinacosaurus up there by birds. <sighs> and I don't want anybody saying, oh yeah, well they must have sounded just like sparrows or chickadees. You know, because, you know, it's up here on the bird graph. That's not what this means. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. And there we go. Take a look at that. Yeah. Hyolaryngeal apparatus of Pinacosaurus in a life reconstruction. The cricoid, purple, and art... Uh, arytenoid green and serratobranchial blue are depicted. Artwork by Tatsuya Shinmura. Very cool. So they're in the throat, not attached to the rest of the skull. Kind of floating there within the flesh. Really, really neat. Yeah. Very, very cool. This is so cool. Yeah. And they really went broad with this paper. This is not just, oh yeah, we're describing something cool in this dinosaur. They're saying this is what it can tell us about dinosaur vocalization, the structure of vocal apparatus within dinosaurs and their closest relatives. This is really, really neat. What a cool paper. Um, very nice. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, like most, this is a nature paper, right? Like most nature papers, nature communications biology, okay. But it's pretty short. But really, really cool stuff. Let me see if, uh... Whoop. Mouse is going haywire here. Uh, uh, although a bird unique vocal source syrinx has never been reported in non avian dinosaurs, Pinacosaurus could have employed bird like vocalization with the bird like large kinetic larynx. Not bird like in that it went chirp chirp, but bird like in that it had a similar kind of structure for producing sound. This is something that I think a lot of media got completely wrong, and they were kind of led astray by some of the press releases from an earlier paper about dinosaur vocalizations. Um, anyway, here's the thing about bird calls. Is that vocal frequency uh, tends to go up when the parts are smaller. And, uh... Yeah, here we go. Oh, this is going to be cool. 
So if you want to try and envision what dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs, would have sounded like, we know that some of them, we have better evidence now with this Pinacosaurus paper, that they had kind of fairly bird-like vocalization apparatus. Except they were larger. When you're larger, the things tend to be kind of lower pitched, lower frequency. And so this sounds really neat. Yeah. Bird sounds like non birds sound like non-avian dinosaurs when slowed down part one. Let's give this a listen, shall we? That's a Eurasian collared dove. Very cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And PX Sharon, I, I, I don't know if it was a hyoid or what it was, but... Yeah, I was certainly hoping I had that right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a peacock there. Yeah. You would pitch it down without slowing it down, Mayor Space. What's the... Is there a distinct difference there? Yeah. And I think a syrinx is something that's unique to modern birds. Uh, birds are done on... I don't think dinosaurs would have had that. Listen to that. What an otherworldly sound. Pretty cool. Holy moly. This one's not as dramatic. Yeah. That's really, really neat. Holy moly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> the sounds of their ancestors. That's not all that different, actually. Yeah, the sounds of put your dog on alert. I'm sorry, Mr. Snipes. <laughs> ah... Very, very cool. Yeah. And Rahab? There's, it's not actually that chickens and T-Rex are closely related. Theropod dinosaurs, Manoraptor and theropods in particular, are kind of equally closely related to all birds. There's nothing special about the relationship between T-Rex and chickens in particular. Between Tyrannosaurus and Gallus. No. Um... Yeah, there you go. Thank you, uh, uh, Claire Burr. Yeah. Now, Eagle... Perhaps I'm not very patriotic for saying this, but not the, not the most interesting. European Robin. Yeah, you know, they, they started off cooler than they ended. But, uh... Yeah, anyway, maybe we'll take a look at some more of those in a bit when we get kicked off with our uh, 
our Thursday birthday. But what a neat paper here. I'm looking forward to reading more about this and seeing what other paleontologists have to say about it. Uh, let's see here. Oh, oh, here we go. Mark Witten had something to say about this. Mark Witten had that blog post earlier about the silent dinosaur hypothesis. He says, The Yoshida et al. Pinacosaurus larynx paper is super exciting. Reframing the conversation about dinosaur vocalization overnight. This is important stuff. But it also presents one interpretation of these data without mentioning other models of dinosaur vocal evolution. Thread. Interesting. Uh, Mark Witten says, quick contextualization. Crocodiles make their noises using a functioning larynx. Well, the bird larynx is non-vocal. I did not know that. There are bird people here in chat who knew that, I'm sure, but I didn't know that. Uh, so the bird larynx can modulate sounds, but doesn't make the sounds itself. Instead, birds use the syrinx, which is a modification of the pathways leading to their lungs to make noises. Yeah... The big deal with Pinacosaurus is the larynx appears more bird-like than crocodile-like. Because dinosaurs probably had bird-like lungs, it's reasonable to wonder if other aspects of avian vocal anatomy, e.g. the syrinx, appeared deep within Dinosauria too. image from Yoshida et al. But there are other ways to interpret this. An important question is why the syrinx evolved at all when the larynx is already a perfectly good voice box. One possibility is that dinosaurs were super vocalizers using two voice boxes... And the other is that the dinosaur larynx was non-vocal, with the syrinx evolving later as a replacement to give dinosaurs their voice back. So again, that's the silent dinosaur hypothesis, I guess. Both of these ideas are nicely summarized in this image from Kingsley et al. 2018. Interesting. Yeah. So, the idea is, yeah, shoot. Were dinosaurs... Really, really noisy? Super vocalizers? Or were they quiet? It's kind of a an either-or sort of a deal here, which I think is interesting. That's the idea put, put, put forth here. Uh, one important aside, voiceless does not equal silent. Non-vocal acoustics, hissing, snorting, booming, popping, etc. can be made without voice boxes. So we don't need to imagine noiseless dinosaur communities even in this model. Uh, so nobody's really, really saying that dinosaurs are silent. Uh, finding that Pinacosaurus larynx is bird-like rejects the first hypothesis. Dinosaurs probably weren't double-voiced. Interesting. Uh, oh man, Mark Witten, the uh, period goes inside the quotation marks. Uh, but it doesn't rule out the second, where dinosaurs lacked a vocal larynx, but hadn't evolved a syrinx yet either. Interesting. Huh. Um, to disprove Hypothesis 2, we need data on when the syrinx appeared. So far, this has been lacking. Mineralized syrinx tissues in the evidence of cardio... Excuse me. Mineralized syrinx tissues in the evidence of the clavicular air sac, structure associated with the syrinx, are found in Cenozoic bird fossils, but... They remain absent in virtually all Mesozoic dinosaurs. Vegevus... Some of you know about this critter. A crown group true bird is the only Mesozoic animal known for certain to have had a syrinx, even with our mountains of dinosaurs with exceptional soft tissue preservation and CT scan data. Uh, anyway, yeah. Surely had to be proto-syrinxes. No idea what they would have looked like. Perhaps were weakly mineralized and left no bony traces. Probably one take home from this paper is that we need to broaden and to rethink our search for evidence of syrinx-like structures. Our attention to date has been focused on theropods for obvious reasons, but what about other dinosaurs? What even about pterosaurs? If we're using pneumatized pectoral girdles and forelimbs to predict syrinx evolution, and we're now thinking there was a deep dinosaur or perhaps basal ornithodiron event, pterosaurs were suddenly very relevant. Even early pterosaurs have pneumatized shoulders and arms. Hmm. This is interesting. And... Mark Witten, uh, pterosaur expert himself. Of course, he's going to be thinking about pterosaurs. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Yeah. Uh, but all this is speculation and arm-waving. If we stick to what we know, we're still some way off from understanding how and if dinosaurs vocalized. The new paper adds critically important data to our discussion, 
but it's a piece in a jigsaw that is still far from complete. I'll stop here. If anyone wants to know more about the evolution of dinosaur vocalization, an article at my blog gives an overview of our knowledge pre Yoshida and colleagues' new work. This is what we were talking about earlier. The silent dinosaur hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Here's a link to that, if you'd like to take a look. And are rhinos noisy? They are, Zaloc. They're not super noisy. Not like elephants. But they make noises. Giraffes are mostly silent? Is that right, Zaloc? I guess that would make sense. Yeah. Anyway, welcome, welcome, Zaloc. Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, and mammals are not the only megafauna still around. We've got other archosaurs that might be considered megafauna. Crocodilians. And big old birds like ostriches, emus, cassowaries, all of which make noise. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and Freelancer, that would be cool if it could be narrated by David Attenborough. You know? Yeah, that would be really neat. So, cool stuff. Cool stuff there. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's go ahead and get rid of some of these tabs here. There we go. And, David I Quinley, thank you for, uh... Yeah, posting that I'm live right now. Appreciate that. On the old Twitter. Good stuff. Now. Uh, we had one more piece of fossil news that I wanted to go over before we get into Thursday Birds Day. And kind of go a little bit more loosey-goosey with our stream. But this just came out today. Holy cow. Functional space analyses reveal the function and evolution of the most bizarre theropod manual ungules. I kind of hope I didn't get scooped on one of these things because I had some ideas about Alvarasaur forelimb function. And uh, thank goodness, another open access paper. We are getting incredibly lucky today, everybody. That is wonderful. Yeah. There we go. Would Arcatuthis be considered megafauna? I don't know, Jody Fish. Giant squid? Not sure. Good question. I don't know. Yeah. Functional space analyses reveal the function and evolution of the most bizarre theropod manual ungules. So what does that mean? We're looking at meat-eating dinosaur claws. As some of the strange ones. I'm trying to figure out what those dinosaurs may have been using them for based on their shape. What we call functional morphology. You know, looking at the structure of, uh, of these features. Trying to figure out what they were for. Yeah. Uh, and st stridulation. I don't know what that is on Indusha. What's stridulation? Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at some of these. In fact, here, a bit of background. Theropod dinosaurs, like we were talking about earlier. Theropods are the two-legged, mostly meat-eating dinosaurs. They're these guys. You know? These guys. Theropods. Everything from Tyrannosaurus to Velociraptor. Spinosaurus to the bee hummingbird. Ostriches. And Allosaurs, Carnotaurus, and Penguins. All theropod dinosaurs. Ooh, boy. Poor baby hadrosaurs getting wrecked by that Tyrannosaur there. But yeah. Yeah. And emus, too. Uh, Mama M Media? Yes, of course. All birds are theropod dinosaurs. Theropods are the most diverse group of dinosaurs. And they're the only group of dinosaurs that are still around today. In the form of birds. They're the only group of dinosaurs that survived the asteroid impact at the end of the age of dinosaurs. They're the only dinosaurs we've still got around. So yeah. Yeah. And is this... Is this going to be halfway decent? Are these just theropods? 
Yeah. Theropod dinosaurs. Here, let's change our playback speed to 1.5 here. These are not particularly good models of these animals. They're actually really not good. They're not great. But, uh, yeah. Some of these guys were very large indeed. Yeah. And many of these are actually the same animal. Allosaurus, Sorophagenax, probably just a very large Allosaurus, etc. Yeah. But anyway, really diverse group of dinosaurs. But one of the things that makes theropods really cool is that they walk on two legs. We don't have any quadrupedal theropods. They all walked on two legs. And because they walked on two legs, that frees up their arms to do really interesting stuff. Some of them, their arms get big and beefy, like on Spinosaurus. They've got huge claws, probably for catching fish. Uh, but for other ther and Dinochirus, big weird arms too. Uh, other theropods, their arms get super small. Some of them, their arms almost go away. Some of them, their arms get really short but really powerful, like in Alvarosaurids. Anyway, the claws, the manual ungules, the hand claws of theropod dinosaurs are often pretty specialized, at least by dinosaur standards, and pretty interesting looking. And that can give us some clues about what these animals may have been doing. You know? Yeah. Uh, oh, an Anandusha, you mean like a cricket. Yeah, we don't have any evidence of that Anandusha, but that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Anywho, very nice. And we just saw Emily Rayfield earlier. She was in that video that we were watching with, uh, with Barry Onyx. Emily Rayfield was, uh, let's see. Hang on a moment here. Here she is right here. That's simply astonishing. One of the most singular specimens I've encountered in all my distinguished career. But enough about my work. What did you want to show me? <laughs> Koniko, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, here is Dr. Emily Rayfield. Right here. Talking about baryonics. Very slippery, wriggling fish. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. They're incredibly deep. They're very Emily deep. Rayfield. They're really yeah. So she does a lot of stuff on um, FEA, finite element analysis, various functional analyses. Uh, basically looking at different structures, especially in dinosaurs, running them through computer models and figuring out like why they have the proportions that they have and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah. Uh... Anyway, and we're looking at Manoraptorans here. Yeah. Alvarosauroids, long, sh uh, short, strong arms. With a stout, rock pick like single functional finger. I don't know if I'd call it a rock pick, but whatever. There are Xenosaurs, long eight fingers, super long claws. Uh, here we develop a comprehensive methodological framework to investigate what the functions of these most bizarre bony claws are and how they formed. So they use FEA, finite element analysis for this, and a newly established functional space analysis, which also involves shape and size effects and an assessment of function and evolution. Interesting. Uh, our analysis reveals that efficient digging capabilities only emerged in late branching alvarosauroid forelimbs, rejecting the hypothesis of functional vestigial structures like T-Rex. So that's not surprising. Um, I'll show you what we mean by this. Uh, before we get to that, the, there is suggestion on there is in a source. That's kind of wild. What? That seems like a distinct lack of imagination there. I don't know. I've not read the whole paper yet, so let's be fair. Um... But yeah. There we go. 
Uh, I know we watched this clip many, many times, but it is... This is a dinosaur particularly near and dear to my heart because I dug up one, or worked on one, very similar to it. Possibly its direct descendant from Montana. But this is Mononychus here. Mononychus is a desert specialist. Hmm. Such hypersensitive directional hearing gives her a mental map of this hollow log. Yep. And what lies within? Hmm. <laughs> she now uses the weapon that gives this hunter its name. Shing. Mononychus. <laughs> Single giant claw. Yeah. Just what she needs to open a termite's nest. Very cool. So these guys have got really, really stout, powerful forelimbs that are very short. Equipment. A flexible tongue twice the length of her head. We don't know for sure that they had a tongue like this, but they, they probably did. I don't know. An excellent protein-packed meal. If only termites weren't quite so irritating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mononychus. That's an Alvarisaurid. Uh, one of my very favorite kinds of dinosaurs. Here's a lovely illustration of Mononychus really emphasizing, almost to a comical degree, those very short forelimbs. As far as we can tell, one finger on each hand. So basically, their arms are like just there for this one big stout claw. That's actually their thumb right there. So they're just kind of walking around, you know, like this uh, with these big, powerful forelimbs. It's not like these are are being reduced because they're losing their arms. It's no, their arms got super short and super muscular for some kind of specialized purpose. That's what they're evolving, is the ability to maybe kind of hook and pull, or something like that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know, cool, cool paper here, discussing the function of Alvarisaurid claws. Uh, there we go. Uh, Mononychus, there's Haplochirus too, which, are we 100% sure that Haplochirus is a, an Alvarisaurid? I thought, some people thought it was an Ornithomimid. Or a, uh... A uh, Limusaurid or something like that. Uh, or Laphrosaurid or something. Anyway, interesting stuff. Here, this is a cool, really cool figure. Holy moly. Beautiful. So they used color mapping for Von Mises Stress. I hope I'm saying that right. Not an engineer. Von Mises Stress. Uh, piercing, hook and pull, scratch digging. Interesting. Uh, huh. Oh, I'm gonna have to read this cover to cover. Uh, start to finish, this paper here. Interesting stuff. Mononychus. Holy cow, oh, but they didn't put, oh no, they didn't put... They didn't study our Triarchuncus, did they? What a shame. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. And Nell says, do you use DVDs or Blu-ray? I don't, Nell, no. I, I don't really... I do have a disc drive. I guess I could use a DVD or a Blu-ray, but why are you asking, Nell? I, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Kodali, thank you for the 12 months of support. Appreciate you, Kodali. Thank you, thank you. For going above and beyond subscribing to this channel to support what I do here. I really appreciate it, Kodali. Um, thank you, thank you for that. It means a lot to me. It really does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh. The infant? <gasps> the adult. Antogeny. <laughs> Feist, thank you for the 23 months of support. I really appreciate that. 23 months. That's also almost a whole year, isn't it? Feist, thank you. Honestly and earnestly, jokes aside, thank you for the 23 months of support, Feist. That's pretty extraordinary. I appreciate you, Feist. I really, really do. Yeah. Um, and with a Prime Gaming sub there, Feist knows how to do it. That free Prime sub, very nice. Yeah. Holy cow. Uh, Clipper says, I thought of a portable DVD player in the field, maybe. Oh, yeah, Claire. I, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't really have any DVDs. I don't know if I own a single DVD. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I appreciate, I appreciate your thought, you're thinking about that, Claire, and, uh, and now. Yeah. VHS? I do actually have a couple of VHSs, DNH, but they're not here in my office. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. Talking about this stuff, I wonder if... This is a shot in the dark here, but let's see. Uh... Uh, Von Mises stress, theory of failure. Let's take a look at this, maybe. In this lecture, we are going to know about the concept of Von Mises stress. Yeah, that's okay. Um, can you find maybe a slicker video about this? Failure theories. We when we apply loads to an object like this bracket, if we keep in we're not going to watch this whole thing. The load, at some point, the material will fail. Yeah. But how can we predict when static failure will occur? Hmm. What level do the stresses in the object need to reach for it to fail? First, we need to define what failure is. For ductile materials, failure is usually considered to occur at the onset really of plastic deformation. No expense. And the thank you, Lenina. Wants up to boy fruit. Thank you, thank you, Lenina, for that gift sub there. I really appreciate that. We're not going to watch this video. This is going to be a little dull, honestly. Um, and I don't know anything about engineering. I appreciate you, Lenina, and how you've engineered that gift sub. That's excellent. And Boyfruit, I hope you... I hope you appreciate being able to use those emotes like these and these for the next 30 days. It's good stuff. So, uh... 201 subs? Is that what that said? Holy cow, Lenina. My goodness, that's extraordinary. That really, really is. Wow, wow, wow. Huge supporter, Claire Bert. You're telling me, Claire. Holy cow, Lenina. Uh, enormous stalwart supporter there. So, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And we got a hype train going. Beautiful. If we manage to get to a level 5 hype train, everybody, I'll play some ukulele songs about science. So let's see if we can get there, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I appreciate you, Lenina. And how you doing, Trappy? Welcome. Yeah. All right, back to here. These are stress maps showing, uh, yeah. Um, basically, at which points the claws, these different claws from different animals, get stressed, and in which places. Uh, I do kind of wonder, since we're only looking at the bony cores here, if you were to put a keratin sheath over that, how much would that change the analysis here? This is why I'm always a little bit suspicious of any kind of, like, really detailed quantitative analysis of something it's like in paleontology we're usually missing really important data points and so if you come up with really really uh you know detailed quantitative analyses it's kind of a garbage in garbage out kind of a deal you know um but yeah that's interesting uh oh and okay i see how this works 
This is for piercing. This is for hook and pull. This is for scratch digging. So these are columns right here. Piercing, we've got... Yeah, some of these guys. Not particularly... And it looks like they've got a lot of stress on them for piercing like that. Hook and pull. These guys all seem to do pretty well. Not good. Yeah, Therizinosaurus doesn't seem to be very... Well, but it's a super long claw. Of course it's going to have... Oh, boy. Anyway, some of this stuff is like no duh. Uh, if Therizinosaurus are indeed using their claws, not as, you know, they're not oh, tearing into stuff with their claws... They're not slashing, they're not digging, they're not hook and pulling. Maybe they are hook and pulling, but just in a very gentle way, you know? They're using those super long claws to help kind of gently pull down branches toward their mouths so they can eat stuff, you know? Is that a, a scenario that's discussed in this paper? Let's look at the abstract. Uh... Our results also support the statement that most Therizinosaurs were herbivores. Okay. However, the bizarre huge Therizinosaurus had sickle-like unguals of such length that no mechanical function has been identified. What about reaching? We suggest they were decorative and lengthened by paramorphic growth linked to increased body size. Therizinosaur claws being decorative... I wonder what Therizinosaur researchers would have to say about this. Um, I don't know if either of these researchers works on Therizinosaurs. I suspect they probably don't. I don't think Michael Button or, or Emily Rayfield do. But that's that's interesting. That is interesting. I I wonder about that. Yeah. Here, give me give me just a second here. Ah. So they would be bad at defending themselves, says Dr. Terra? I mean... I don't know. Um... Yeah... I need to read through the paper before I can actually be critical about any of this stuff, because I didn't do this work, you know? Something I always gotta remind myself when I'm, uh... Looking at a paper like this, reading through it for the first time live on stream. Gotta remember, hey, I didn't look at these specimens. I didn't run these analyses. So easy to criticize when, uh, when you're not the one doing the hard work, you know? So this is a cool paper, and I'm so glad this is out there, and this is definitely something I'm gonna cite when, uh, when I end up uh, working on a paper using kind of a different method to kind of attack the same problem. This is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, better at hook and pull, better at piercing. Uh -huh. Graphs, graphs, graphs. Interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, of course, Therizinosaur claws are so big and ridiculous. Therizinosaurus, by the way, is this animal. For the uninitiated, that is an excellent Therizinosaurus. Holy moly. So this is a big, ridiculous plant-eating dinosaur. Maybe omnivorous, probably mostly plant-eating. Um... Yeah, this is descended from big meat-eating dinosaurs. Or maybe little meat-eating dinosaurs. But anyway, it's descended from meat-eating dinosaurs as a Manoraptoran. And, uh... But... These guys kind of slowly, over time... Became plant-eaters. Their guts got bigger. They kind of shifted to a more upright stance like this. They would have been pretty slow-moving. And their forelimbs are out here, and they develop these big, ridiculous claws like this. Okay, two places. That's a big, scary bird. Yeah. Yeah. Those are feathers on it. 
these are these are pretty cool critters. They really are with ridiculous claws on them. Just nuts. Uh, there's the really lousy Jurassic World. There is an oh, this is garbage. It's complete dog water. Ugh. Anyway, yeah, there's a much better one. There is an Asaurus right there. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And here's one without any feathers on it, which is not, well, very paltry feathers. That's also kind of lousy. Um, but yeah, yeah. What a neat animal, Therizinosaurus. Therizinosaurus is kind of the most therizinosaurus y of all the, Therizinosauri of all the Therizinosaurs. It's kind of taken to an extreme. Uh, you've got earlier dinosaurs like Bapiosaurus that we went over the other day. Uh, yeah, they're less dramatic. What a beautiful graph there. Leo the Amigo, and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Yeah. And the tail has feathers? Yep. Yes, indeed. Uh, Redub. Most likely. Yeah. That tail, probably, uh, probably all feathery like that. We do have evidence of feathers on Bapiosaurus in particular. Uh, Bapiosaurus, which is not a very big Therizinosaur. It's honestly kind of small. Um, but here's maybe my favorite Bapiosaurus reconstruction of these guys just running through a Cretaceous forest, barreling through. They must have got spooked by something, and they're just running everybody over. Um... Yeah, everybody else is just trying to get out of the way. <laughs> and that is one good-looking graph, isn't it, Leo the Amigo? Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Rothgar, how are you doing? Good to have you here. Yeah. And uh, this is like cheap fast food. Yes, indeed, now. Yes, indeed. Not this, but the, uh, the Jurassic World... There is an Asaurus is just dog water. Just uh, this isn't even cheap fast food. This is dog food. <laughs> it's slop thrown to the pigs. <laughs> it's garbage. Oh boy, yeah. Um, this, however, lovely. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. So anyway, there is an source. I need to actually read through this whole paper. Uh, I realize I have a tendency to be like, well, what about this? What about that? And honestly, I'd be really embarrassed if any of the authors were watching this. <laughs> what do I know? I've never done FEA in my whole life. I'm sure this is wonderful stuff. And uh, I'm definitely going to be citing this paper once I uh, finally start working on Alvera sore claws like I'd like to. Get back into working on other sword claws, I mean. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. And, Claire Burr, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I don't know the difference between a gnat and a midge. Do midges bite? Maybe gnats bite, too. Who knows? Brother Bam, how are you doing? What's my favorite dinosaur? Oh, holy cow. I've got several favorite dinosaurs, Brother Bam. It's so hard to choose. Somebody pull up that command. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. Yeah, there's a few different dinosaurs that are among my favorites for certain. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there's a few other dinosaurs that could also be on the favorite dinosaurs list. Trirarchuncus. This is Mononychus, but same deal. Another one of my favorites. What a cool critter. And, uh... Yeah. Hopefully I'm going to be working on these guys sometime in the next couple years. And, uh... Publishing on the function of their claws. Because I've got what I think is a cool and readily accessible method for, uh... For figuring that out. Uh... Drawing a neat parallel, at least. But, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh. So yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. There's three really interesting new publications for Fossil News there. And, uh, I'm glad we could go through them. Yeah. But, of course, today is Thursday. And Thursday is... What's that I hear? Is that a non-avian dinosaur? What are these bizarre sounds? They're birds. Just slowed down. Birds, of course, are living dinosaurs. Birds are the only group of dinosaurs that survived the asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous period 66 million years ago. Today is Thursday, Birds Day. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Today's Thursday Bird's Day. And uh, I don't have an official Thursday Bird's Day uh, intro video yet. So uh, have this instead. Um, and while you're watching that, I'm going to go run to the little paleontologist room. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to go over Thursday Birds Day Birds. But enjoy this first. You need to take some of your own advice. Aren't you the man who told me to live every week like it's Shark Week? And that nothing's impossible except for dinosaurs? Don't give up on life, sir. Wow. <laughs> Love Bird's Day. Varmint, thank you for the 27 months of support. That is extraordinary. I had to come running back to pause that for that. But yeah, holy 27 months. It's almost a whole year, isn't it? Really appreciate you, Varmint. Thank you, thank you. Anyway, let's, let's start this over. I'll be right back. There we go. It's Thursday Birds Day, everybody. And I hope you're excited for it. This is the weekly part of Paleontologizing, our weekly recurring series in which members of this community go out and photograph birds during the week. They submit a bird photograph to the Thursday Birds Day section of our Discord. And we talk about these amazing birds live on Twitch. I think it's really important every week to, to go outside, make sure you're spending some kind of time out in nature, a place where you might see birds, even if it's just walking around your neighborhood or sitting on your porch or whatever. These don't have to be brilliant National Geographic quality photographs. They could be a crummy, blurry photo with a flip phone of a pigeon or a morning dove or a house sparrow the thing is we've got birds all around us all the time there's like 10,000 species of living birds birds actually outnumber mammals species like two to one 
You could really say we're still in the age of dinosaurs if you wanted to. You wouldn't be wrong, I suppose. But birds are all around us, and it's really important to appreciate them, and... I don't know. They're an easy way to kind of connect to nature, and... Kind of reflect on the change in the seasons. We get different birds coming in at different times of year. To reflect on what's going on weather-wise, food-wise, in terms of our environments. It... I don't know. Birds are just a wonderful way to kind of... Remind yourself that we're all part of this grand web of life on Earth. Birds are pretty great. So yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. An Eagle Star Trucker. Is that what this is called? Dark Mountain Forest is what it says. Zelda... A link to the past. I see what they did there. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, nice there, Eagle Star Trucker. Sharp ears. Yeah. So good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Leo the Amigo says, I should take a picture of, my, of a raven eating my dog's food. Yeah, absolutely. That counts. So let's go into the Discord. And, uh... Let's take a look at these lovely boids for Thursday... Thursday Bird's Day. There we are. Go down to th Thursday Bird's Day section and... Let's see... Goldeneye. Ah, Goldeneye. Beautiful. And while links. From Dr. Javasaurus, we've got a cormorant there. And we are blessed in this community to have several members of chat who are enthusiastic birders and know far more about bird identification than do I. Is this a double crested or a brant cormorant? Anybody? Green Herring, what do you think? You probably know your cormorants better than I know mine. This is a double crested or a brant's cormorant. But let's let's look up cormorants. Cormorants are some of my favorite birds. They are. Uh, I say that about almost every bird, though. Cormorants. Cormorants. Cormorants are actually responsible for many, many Loch Ness monster sightings, believe it or not. Uh, frequently mistaken for the Loch Ness monster. <laughs> or, I don't know, if the Loch Ness monster isn't real, which, let's be honest, it's probably not. This is the real Loch Ness monster. Cormorant. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's a lovely picture, Moonrise Rabbit. The one that uh, that Mayor that uh, Doctor Javasaurus took. Look at that. Cormorants. Very cool critters. They like to sun themselves like this in the early morning. When the sun comes up, they'll stretch out their wings like that, and they'll just absorb the sun's rays. These are diving birds. Cormorants are, uh, yeah, they are, they're cool but annoying for fishermen. I'm sure they feel the same way about fishermen, you know? They're like, who are these people in my environment trying to eat my fish? What's wrong with them? But I seem to recall that, uh, in certain parts of the world, fishermen... Here we go. Oh. Sorry, apologies to anybody watching on watching this later on uh, YouTube, but you're not going to be able to hear the sound here. Uh, check this out. Fishing with birds. Ah. Uh. Wait. 
All the men are called what? I'll call Huang. Yeah, I suppose it's like the uh, the philosophy part department of the University of Wellabaloo. You know the the Australian philosophy department sketch where all their names are Bruce. You know, it helps avoid confusion when they've all got the same name. You know. Yeah. Look at those birds. Oh. Those poor cormorants. Oh no. They can't enjoy that. <laughs> Very cool. They're like little Hesperornis. It's famous, uh, Cretaceous diving birds. That's a little too big for you, buddy. Oh, no, it's not. Holy cow. Look at the size of that fish. They're able to catch. That's amazing. I've never actually seen footage of cormorants catching fish underwater. That's extraordinary. Wow. That's pretty extraordinary. Very, very cool. Holy cow. That's so neat. The fish are so slow compared to the cormorants. I'm kind of astonished. I thought they'd be catching little tiny fishes. These are fishes bigger than their heads. Huh. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Good for them. There you go. Ah, <laughs> uh, good for them. <laughs> and they can count up to seven. Holy cow, Claire Burr. That's pretty astonishing. Like, I don't know. I, I've known, like, yeah, like four and five year old children who can't count to seven yet, you know? That's that's pretty incredible that cormorants can do that. Um very nice. That was super cool. So uh anyway, Dr. Javasaurus, what a cool critter. I'm guessing this is probably a Brant's cormorant, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um but very nice. And then who are these? Well we've got multiple Dr. Javasaurus, we're supposed to have one Thursday Bird's Day bird per Thursday Bird's Day. Thursday. These might be some kind of grebe or loon? Somebody in chat tell me what these lovely water birds are. I do not know what they are. They look kind of greeby to me. They are grebes. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. I'm glad they're grebes. Yeah. Horned Greaves, maybe. Crested Greaves is uh, Biosalat Gurk. They are dinosaurs, Bliss9. All of these are going to be dinosaurs. They're all birds, you know? Yeah. Here. Uh, let's try... Crested Greeb. That's it. That's the one. Crested Greeb. Yes, indeed. 
Very nice. Yeah. Excuse me. Beautiful pictures. And are these more... I, every time a bird has gold eyes, I want to call it a golden eye. But what is this, chat? Somebody tell me. Somebody who knows more about bird identification than do I. Yeah. These are great pictures, Claire Bear. They really are. Yeah. And Delta Rain, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Delta. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, these are great pictures. That bokeh effect going on. Good stuff. Yeah. Let me get my bird book, says Miss Yvette. Well, shoot. Uh, whatever they are, they're beautiful. Lenina says, I have an extremely talkative crow. He kept talking as I passed him. And I could still hear him going over a block away. See, there... Ah, uh, crows are one of my very favorite birds. How many times am I going to say that today? But crows are one of my very favorite birds. They're incredibly intelligent. They're all over the place. You can see them. They're what we would call cosmopolitan, almost. You see them all over the world. Uh, yeah, genus Brachyrhynchos, I think? Or is it Corvus Brachyrhynchos? I forget. Anyway, crows. Really, really cool birds, and they are remarkably intelligent. Yeah. And Delta Rain says, I like the big ravens out by Ocean Beach. Ravens and crows, different birds. They're related, but they are different. Delta, I made friends with the ravens, not at Ocean Beach in San Francisco, but at... Uh... I wonder if I'm going to be able to find this. Not at Ocean Beach, but at Baker Beach, north of Ocean Beach. And I've got some photos way up close with the crows. I would sit down to eat a snack in the morning, and they would just alight on the bench right next to me, like a couple of feet away. It was pretty magical. I was able to kind of earn their trust. Uh, such cool critters. Yeah. Um, scrolling, 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 trying to find, trying to find... I don't know if I'm going to find... Can I just search Raven? Yeah, there we go! <laughs> yes! Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> These are big, beautiful ravens. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Extremely clever birds, too. They are very, very smart. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Corvus Corax. Yes, indeed, Anandusha. Corvus Corax, the American raven. Yeah, or common raven. And I think... Oh, I don't have the picture. I'm searching through Google Photos, and it doesn't recognize the the raven in the picture where it... I'm sitting on a bench, and there's this raven sitting next to me on the bench. We we made friends. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, they use cars as tools. They do, Delta Rain. Well, shoot. Do we need to find this again? Uh... Yeah. Here we go. Crows have been. Yep. They know the crosswalk singles? Yes, indeed, Claire Burr, they do. Very cool. <laughs> That's good stuff. Uh <laughs> Yeah. 
Get wrecked, nuts. Yeah, crack, crack. <laughs> Collecting the bits. Hang on a minute. Don't I have that as an alert? If I don't, I... Maybe I never uploaded it. Yeah. <laughs> she just illuminate with a picture of a crow, a crow silhouette. Bloop. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Very cool, Crow. Very, very cool. But get out of the way. Yeah. Such cool animals. They're so clever. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Lenina, for uh, posting this. Very vocal, Crow. Lenina says, uh, I crack open acorns by stepping on them as I walk through my neighborhood. That way I can feed the crows without feeding them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And Delta Rain says, around here, you'll often see them following squirrels as they bury nuts in the fall, and then they dig them up when the squirrel goes away. See? That's dinosaurs, you know, <laughs> taking advantage of their mammal neighbors. And it's a tradition that goes back about 240 million years, give or take. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, let's see. And Andusha says, ever seen a pair of ravens steal a fish from an eagle? It's a sight that hold. I've never seen that. No, that sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. There's a wonderful, wonderful book that I'd like to recommend to you about crows, actually. Uh, one of these days when I finally make a website... I'm going to have a page on recommended books. This one, Crow Planet. Essential Wisdom from the Urban Wilderness by Leanda Lynn Haupt. Excellent, excellent book. Um, it's, it's really extraordinary. Uh, I kind of wanted to capture some of the magic from that for Thursday Bird's Day. You know, that's what this is all about. Is, uh... Well, hang on, is a minute. People decided to have a, ra a drag race outside my window. Um... Yeah. There are many, many cool birds around us, even if we often take them for granted. Crows are just about everywhere, and yet they are such incredible, intelligent, sociable, interesting animals. You might see dozens of crows in a given day and not pay any notice at all to them. But they lead such interesting lives, and sometimes being able to recognize stuff like that throughout your daily life, it can enrich your life so much. Just being able to go, oh yeah, that's what the crows are doing today. They seem like they're having a good time, you know? It just, that sort of thing makes me really happy. And I, you know, I hope it can bring joy to your day as well too. So by creating Thursday Birds Day and encouraging people to take pictures of birds in their neighborhood or birds that they see throughout the week, hoping to get you to, to pay more attention to those birds that we share our neighborhoods with. Because they bring us a lot of joy. Give us kind of a different perspective on things, you know? So, yeah. My neighborhood's a very lively place, Claire Burr. <laughs> uh, don't get me started. But, yeah. Uh, and very loud. Yeah, Delta Ring. Crows can be very loud. They're very vocal animals. And Tough Juice. I get asked this all the time. I've never been to the Royal Terrell in Alberta. No. 
you're sending your son to dinosaur camp there this summer. Very cool, Tough Juice. Very, very cool. I hope he has a great time. Yeah. I used to dig just south of there in uh, Montana. Uh, near, like, uh, Haver, Montana, Rudyard, Montana, those areas. Yeah. Anyway. Cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, and someone called Dragon Rocker. How are you doing? There's zero crows where you live? I'm sorry to hear that. Do you live under the ocean? Someone called Dragon Rocker. Where don't crows live? Holy cow. Crows are just about everywhere. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And hunting insects. Layer Chop, you were hunting some insects? Or no, these birds were. Let's take a look at this, shall we? Ooh, there's a gull. That's I love I love a short video. Yep. Yeah, catching some insects there. That's a gull. My Thursday Birds Day bird might also be a gull. Very cool, Layer Chop. What kind of gull is this, I wonder? Gulls are hard to identify. It's got a black bill. Doesn't look very big. Could be a black-billed gull? I don't know. Yeah. And crows and guam are endangered. They've probably been supplanted by non-native crows, I, I guess. But yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And, uh... Mariana crows. Interesting, Delta Rain. Okay. Huh. You know, actually, let's look that up. Let's look it up on our, uh, Tree of Life. Mariana crows. And we can look at all these different species of crows here. Mariana crow... I think it's a young red build gull. The beaks change color as they age. Cool, Layer T. That's ontogeny there. Yeah. Uh. Mariana Crow. Yeah. Critically endangered. Ontogeny. Holy moly. Yeesh. They're related to the large build crow and the white necked crow, who are vulnerable. Holy moly. Lots and lots of species of crows and ravens. 36 species, 39 species, yeah, crows, ravens, and jackdaws, all gen uh, genus named Corvus, 44 species, pretty cool, rooks and jackdaws, ravens, fish crows, and other crows, very neat, um, yeah, and you move out a little bit further and you get nutcrackers, Two. But further than that, you get magpies also. I love magpies. We actually have a magpie on the uh, starting soon screen for our broadcast. Here, check it out. Did you spot the magpie? Yeah. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Dragnet Rocker, did dinosaurs ever do stuff like, say, dust bathing? Probably. We I don't know if we have any direct evidence of dust bathing in non-bird dinosaurs. But modern birds will dust bathe. And uh, I don't know if crocodilians will. They're, they, crocodilians tend to be pretty aquatic. I don't know if they dust bathe. They probably do, though. I don't know. So, yeah. It's it's easy for me to imagine dinosaurs dust, ba dust bathing. We don't have any direct evidence of that. But there's no reason to think that that no dinosaurs did that. Yeah. Yeah, lots of mammals do that now. Yeah. Yeah. Birds also do another thing uh, called anting. I wonder if I can find a video about that because I've always wondered about this. Uh, bird anting. Yeah. 
Ho oh, ho ho, very weird and cool. Here is a bird finding an ant nest. See all those little ants zooming around right there? Yeah. It's a Eurasian jay, and it is anting. It is letting those ants crawl all over it. It's doing this on purpose. This is not a bird that's typically spending most of its time on the ground. It came here to find the ants, and it's got ants in its pants. Look, this is, this is crazy, you know? Yeah. It's an ant bath, Claire Burr. In high temperature and high humidity, birds have a lot of parasites in their bodies. Ah, look at all those ants crawling all over this bird. So they come back to the ant colonies. Very weird and cool. <laughs> ah. Uh, this action is anting. Yeah. And so it's thought... There are some species of bird that I think basically do this. They just let the ants climb all over them. I I've heard that there's other birds that will sit on top of the ant mound and then they'll actively, like, smush the bird... The, they'll smush the ants into their feathers. Maybe to get that formic acid onto their feathers in order to... Some sort of a protection against parasites or something like that. Uh, yeah. Green Herring says they'll also pick up the ants and rub them all over their feathers. Yeah, really crazy, right? Really, really, really neat behavior. Um, yeah, really wild. Here's a... Here, we'll see if we watch this. Uh... Wait, here's another one. Shoot. Before we watch the one with the narration. Yeah. So here are... I don't know what kind of birds these are. Azure-winged magpies. I thought they looked like magpies or jays. But yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, this one right here has just grabbed an ant in its beak. And watch, it's probably going to rub it on its feathers. Oh, it's grabbing some ants. Yep, this one's doing that. Very weird and cool. I wonder how far this behavior goes back in time. Like, when this first originated. This is pretty wild, right? Yeah. Really cool. I could watch this all day. Uh, what a weird, cool behavior. And birds. Let's take a look at this one here. Look at all those ants. Nobody tell Blint. Dinosaurs being unkind to ants. Jackdaw. Daw. Jackdaw. Very cool. Oh, but the birds like it. <laughs> Very cool. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and how many brave ant soldiers die in the process? I don't even know. That's pretty wild. Pretty cool.
Look at all those lady ants. Interesting. Or for feathers, apparently. Very cool. <laughs> uh, aren't birds amazing? Very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. Delta Rain says, fast forward to evolution. Maybe the ants will have evolved a way to benefit from this behavior by the birds. Oh, no, Delta Rain. Oh, no. we find tells us something about how the world was. 80 million. 80 million years ago. Dr. Luces, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah, shoot. You know, we might have a mashup of two classic horror films. Them with the ants and the birds with the birds. When the ants and the birds finally team up, will it be the end of humanity? When the birds... And the ants figure out how to benefit from one another. It's goodbye to civilization. Uh-oh. And, uh... But yeah. Yeah. Uh... It, it well, might well be the ant of humanity. There you go, Anandusha. Yes. Um... <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. And, uh... Ragnarokker. Who would want Spinos Carcharodontosaurus or Spinosaurus? Or Spinosaurus? Carcharodontosaurus or Spinosaurus? I, what, I, I don't know. Dinosaur man. Dinosaur man. <laughs> uh, Miggity Marty. Thank you for the two months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I don't really... I try not to give odds on fights between dinosaurs. Someone called Dragnar Rocker. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not a super testable question, you know? <laughs> Have you seen Ant-Man? There's an Ant-Man, Miss Yvette? I have seen the Ant-Man. His name is Belint, and he streams here on Twitch at twitch.tv slash streams. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Can we get a shout out for Belint real quick? <laughs> um, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, anyway, back to our uh, Thursday Birds Day Discord birds. Yeah. And Gimpleg, we got some mallards there. Very nice. Two drakes off in the background. Yeah, a little, something a little weird and dreamlike about this photo, but yeah. We've got drakes in the background there. And a and some hens. Female ducks are called hens, is that right? Are they called hens? Yeah. Ant-man versus Birdman and Avenger. Eagle Star Trucker. Yes. Ant-Man versus Birdman versus Powdered Toast Man. Who will win? Uh, Green Herring says, Bald Eagle with their breakfast under the right foot. The crows did not have much luck trying to sneak a bite. They are, they're cheeky. They're cheeky corvids, those crows. And there is a bald eagle. That was my Thursday Bird's Day bird from last Thursday Bird's Day. Last Thursday. Was uh, a bald eagle. Uh, Leucocephalus heliatus, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that's the binomial for a bald eagle. Beautiful photo there. Really nice green herring. That's, that's really, really lovely. I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Delta rain. No, sir. I don't like it. <laughs> Delta rain knows what's up, as usual. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. And Rex and Tyrannosaurus Rex. I do have a Tyrannosaurus emote. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah, I already have a Tyrannosaurus emote. It's the science one. I have several Tyrannosaurus emotes. There's the yes ones, too. Those are also Tyrannosaurus. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And the crows used to dive bomb the falcon, maybe to knock the food away, says SV Harkin. Well, crows will also just mob other birds, like birds of prey. They do this all the time. Um, yeah. Bird mobbing. Here's crows mobbing a bald eagle right here. Take a look at this. There's those crows. Look at those f frantic wing flaps. That's not a relaxed crow. So other birds typically don't like it when there's a, a carnivorous bird around. And they will do their best to drive the other bird off. They'll just harass it until it goes away. Whether it's an eagle, whether it's a hawk, a kestrel, a falcon, they'll go after it. Yeah, unpatriotic crows, Hojo Cat. <laughs> yeah, they're not after any food that the eagle has. The eagle doesn't have any food there. They're just trying to scare off a bird of prey. Eagles like this, well, bald eagles mostly eat fish. So the maybe the crows are overreacting a little bit. <clears throat> it's unlikely that an eagle would go after and eat a crow, but they'll do it on occasion, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The eagle doesn't just kill him? No, Layer T. Can't, can't catch them like this. The crows are at an advantage here. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Got hit there. So typically birds of prey, they're not very good at, like, fighting other birds. If a, a bird of prey is going to eat another bird, it's going to, it's because it gets the drop on it. It's because it comes out of nowhere and just grabs it. You know? In a, like, a one-on-one -on -one fight, they're not... They're not great fighters like that, you know? There was a famous image of, um... Uh, let's see... Yeah... Here we go. <laughs> uh... Uh, this is a little jackdaw or some kind of little corvid J type bird. Uh, going after this. Is this a Philippine eagle? What kind of eagle is this? Anyway, it's got a snake in its talons. This bird's not happy that this uh, big meat-eating bird is around. And he's like, get out of here. So they'll, you know, they'll buzz them like that. They go, zoom. But somebody got this remarkable photo just as soon as the other bird has landed before pushing off again and continuing to fly. Isn't that cool? Really, really neat. Yeah, the face that the eagle is making, right, Claire Burr? Yeah. That's, uh... That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Which reminds me of, uh... Yeah... Um, <laughs> this is just ridiculous at this point, but why not? We're having fun. <laughs> An old Photoshop Friday thing from something awful way back in the day. Gnats. Gnats. It's probably a singular gnat that's been around the whole stream. It's lot, not leave me alone. But, uh, birds with human arms and hands. Uh, pretty brilliant stuff. Yeah, from way back in the day. <laughs> Here we go, lol, says Clarebur. Yes, indeed. Um. <laughs> uh. So good. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh boy. Um. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. There's four more pages of that. Oh, that's. Uh. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> it just gets increasingly more ridiculous. Yeah. Um <laughs> uh, <clears throat> somebody kind of misunderstood <laughs> the prompt here. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Beautiful. Anyway, <laughs> So birds' hands are there in their wings, you know? A birds' arms are their wings. They don't have six limbs, you know? So this is obviously... I don't have to tell you this is ridiculous. But yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good stuff. Yeah. Um... Anyway, oh man, there's so many more pages of this. Um... Uh, Anyway, you can find that on your own if you'd like. It's birds with human arms and hands. Um, but yeah, good stuff. Anyway, um, yeah. Maskling posting here says, I have two recordings of whole flocks of jackdaws. And one photo of a juvenile Ross's gull from today's trip to the park. Very nice. And this is today at 9.27 a.m. Maskling, very nice. Whole flock of jackdaws there. Very nice. Very social birds. Like many corvids and their relatives are. Really nice. Very cool. Yeah. And then... Who is this? <clears throat> Could be missing important calls. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah. Anyway, nice. And, uh, yep. And a juvenile... Who is it? Uh, a juvenile Ross's gull from today's trip to the park. Very cool. A juvenile Ross's gull. Gulls are some of these, I think, severely underappreciated birds. They're really, really neat. And... <laughs> Keanu has somehow anticipated our birds with hands digression. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a Ross's gull. Are these guys rare? Let's look them up. <clears throat> uh, Ross's gull. Here we are. There we are. They are least concerned, but look, very pretty. Holy moly. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to be looking more at gulls in a bit. 52 species of gulls and kitty wakes. I do not know what a kitty wake is, but apparently it's related to gulls. Yeah, that's a gull right there. Kitty wake. Give it a special name. Anyway, yeah. Um, very cool. A Ross's gull. Really neat, Maskling. Really neat. Yeah. And last picture is of Beak, where he, al he allows me to touch his beak. He also loves saying Beak. Beak, wee bird. That, oh, that's lovely. Is this a an African gray parrot, maybe? Incredibly smart birds, African gray parrots. Uh... Oh. <laughs> and yep, cow. Very nice birds with that on. Very, very cool. African gray parrots are 
extraordinarily intelligent. Uh, they're, I don't know, just to give you some frame of reference, an African gray parrot is smarter than I am. Um, here, take a look. Einstein, everyone. All right. Einstein, are you excited? Woo! All right. Tell everybody. His name is Einstein. Oh, she's getting ready. She's got to clear her throat. Can you tell them your name? Einstein. Yes, Einstein. Oh! <laughs> hey, hi. Can you say hi? Hello. That's nice. But be polite. That's sweetheart. That's much better. Oh. Okay, let's with some animal sounds first. Can you do... Oh, okay. <laughs> Got to clear your throat. Let's do a wolf. Good. How about a bird? Can you do a bird? Good. Get an owl. Get an owl. How about a rooster? How about a penguin? Can you do a penguin? <laughs> this is penguin. She, she says penguin. <laughs> Sometimes they get chunky. You think they need to go on a diet? How about diet? There you go. How about some tigers? Yeah, anyway, you, you get the idea. But African gray parrots, incredibly intelligent birds. They don't just do stuff like that. They, uh... Yeah, I don't know. Shoot. Let's take a look at this right here. Yeah. Uh oh, there you go, birds with that on, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> 12 years. Holy cow. Good for him. Hmm. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Wow, this bird's going to be better at math than I am. Wow. That's almost a whole year. <laughs> That's a long distance for a parrot to fly. Holy cow. All the way from Boston. Oh, flown in, wait, from Tennessee? What did I? From Tennessee to Boston. Okay. This is the same Einstein that we saw on that old clip from Animal Planet. Pretty cool. By the way, these birds can live an incredibly long time. African gray parrots can live like over 60 years, right? Oh. Hmm. Not enough chimpanzees, unfortunately. Kind of endangered. It's the same act that we just saw earlier. <laughs> if it works, it works, you know? Yeah. Mm. 
Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, very cool stuff. Very cool indeed. African gray parrots, incredibly intelligent animals. Uh... Probably smarter than me. Really, really cool birds. Uh... Want a seed? Means he wants a seed. Very nice, birds are dead on. That's super cool. Yeah. Man, if I want a seed, I have no I, I have no way how to express that, you know? Shoot, I go seedless. You know? Uh... Etc. There you go, birds are dead on. Yeah. <laughs> Get these two birds to have a conversation? I don't know, Laertie. They might take over. Yeah. Uh... But yeah, yeah. And Moonrise Rabbit has got a story for us. Uh, they say, went out to a park by a lake near my house earlier to get a picture of any sort of feathered flint fauna. But there were none. No crows, no sparrows, no ducks, nothing. Really? Uh-oh. I've seen birds in the wild, but only while I was driving. And in no way were able to pull over safely to take a picture. Hawks by highways, turkeys in the township, geese on golf courses. Nice alliteration there. Uh, it's cold and nasty here, so nothing wants to be outside if it has to, myself included. Okay, gotcha. I'm lucky. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are birds everywhere all the time. Uh, so here you have my parakeets, Kihar and Ron Swanson. Oh, I get it. Ron Swanson, because he's like the son of a swan. Not indigenous to Flint, but this is what you get. I hate the cold. Oh. Beautiful birds there. Beautiful birds. Holy cow. Um, very nice. Thank you for your contribution. You've got a couple of lovely theropod dinosaurs there. Moonrise Rabbit, you really do. Uh, Moonrise Rabbit, I appreciate you. I really, really do. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, man, she really does have some lovely birds. Yeah. Dr. Tara, Cooper's Hawk? Is that a Cooper's Hawk? I don't know my birds of prey well enough. My raptor identification skills are subpar. It probably is a Cooper's Hawk. It looks small. Cooper's Hawks are often small. Yeah, but, uh, neat. Anybody here in chat confirm or deny the presence of a Cooper's Hawk? Hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah and hey, Freya's Fury, how are you doing? Welcome back. Good to see you. Yeah. Northeast Texas. Oh, cool, Dr. Tara. Nice. It's a tough angle, Green Herring? Yeah. <clears throat> Very cool. I was out looking for a bird of prey today, and I didn't spot it. Um, Art Forever. Who, who is this? Hmm. It's not often you see a bird wearing clothes. I don't know. Is this some sort of toucan? What's with the interesting color difference between the eye and the beak right there? That's interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Cooper's Hawk went into a grocery store? The wildlife got her and... Re the wildlife got... Oh, like wild have, wildlife re re rehabilitation people, Amelia? Interesting. And howdy howdy, Miss Yvette. How are you doing? Good to have you here. Yeah. And, uh... Oh, very nice, Freya. Yeah. It's a Comic Con, so I gathered, Miss Yvette. It's got a Comic Con t shirt. And Layer Trump, very pretty. Who is this? Is that a rock dove? Some kind of dove. Some sort of columbiform bird. Beautiful. Very nice. Uh, nice, Layer Trump. Very, very nice. 
And, uh, oh, very cool. Paper cuts. Not your photos, but these are brilliant. Theropod versus mammal. And pretty astonishing. You've got a wolf fighting an animal that is got to be like one-tenth its weight. Holy cow. Eagles are pretty formidable critters. Man, when they do that mantling thing with their wings, they could be very intimidating indeed. Um, yeah. Let's see. Prey mantling. There we go. That's this behavior right here. Wait, warning. Anyway, yeah, ooh, a little bit grisly there. But they do a thing called prey mantling, where they'll try and hide their prey from other potential predators or scavengers or thieves. They'll use those wings to kind of shade it so somebody else can't see what's going on. Really cool. You know, it's easy to imagine dinosaurs like dromaeosaurs doing the very same thing. Yeah. Uh, like this, or like this. Beautiful work there. Oh, there's a little ornithopod dinosaur just... Oof. Yeah. Uh, there's another example there. Yowza. <laughs> ah! Yeah. Um, Mandling, my food, no steel, green herring. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And someone called Dragon Rocker. Yes, indeed. Nobody likes getting their food stolen. So, yeah. Yeah. Man, lovely illustrations of prey mantling for different dromaeosaurs. This is, this is so cool. There's a Deinonychus doing it. Uh, yeah. A Cararaptor. Very nice. Good stuff. These, of course, are dromaeosaurs. What members of the public often call raptor dinosaurs. Because the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park is a dromaeosaur. It's actually Deinonychus. It's not Velociraptor at all. But anyway, we now know these animals were all covered with feathers like this. Beautiful artwork from Gabriel Agueto there. Just gorgeous. Really, really nice. I love the uh, the Utah Raptor there. A big hulking kind of light brown one. I think that's supposed to be Utah Raptor. Just beautiful. Very, very nice. Yeah. Uh, again, the line between dinosaurs, between non-avian and avian dinosaurs, pretty blurry. Yeah. It probably wouldn't surprise you to learn. It, would, it might not shock you to learn that some paleontologists think that dinosaurs like these, Velociraptor, Utahraptor, Deinonychus, etc., Troodon and relatives, some paleontologists think they were actually birds. It all depends on where birds split off from uh, from the rest of the dinosaur family tree. Did birds split off earlier than we thought? And these guys are actually descendants of the bird branch? That would make them birds if that were the case. We don't really know for sure. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, movie Velociraptors would be technically Utah. They're not. Ragnarok or no, they're Deinonychus. Utah Raptor was only it was only published after the movie Jurassic Park came out. Uh here, I one of these days I'm gonna make a video about this. In fact, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it in for release in April. Um International Velociraptor Day. Is April 18th. A lot of people seem to have misperceptions about what's going on with the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World Velociraptors. And I'd love to be able to make a video to kind of clear that up. Maybe I'll do that and set it for release right before April 18th. Yeah. But anyway. Um, but someone called Dragon Rocker. Now that's the thing. Utah Raptor was not a thing yet when Jurassic Park came out. 
Utah Raptor only came out after. You know that. Here, I'll show you. Here's a smoking gun. Uh, the novel Jurassic Park came out in 1990. The film Jurassic Park came out in 1993. Uh, Utah Raptor was named in 1993 by Jim Kirkland. You know, I work with the guy who named Utah Raptor. Um, when Michael Crichton was writing his novel Jurassic Park, he was working on it in the late 1980s. He referenced this book, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World, by Greg Paul. And in this book, Greg Paul talks about all kinds of theropod dinosaurs. But he does something kind of interesting in this. There we go. Uh, 369 to 370. Mm -hmm. Uh... Let's see. There we go. Uh, well, first off here, let me show you. Velociraptor is not a particularly big animal. It's fairly small. Um, it's from Mongolia, too. Velociraptor mongoliensis, not a very big animal. Uh, Velociraptor was not, it was not a very famous dinosaur until after Jurassic Park came out. First the novel and then especially the movie, holy cow. Nobody in the general public had ever heard of Velociraptor until the novel Jurassic Park. And then the movie made it a superstar, holy cow. But the dinosaur that was from the same family that was uh, really well known was Deinonychus. And uh... Here, I'll show you another book real quick. Yeah! Uh, here we go. Tyrannosaurs, there we go, yeah. Dromaeosaurs. This is Deinonychus right here, who is front and center on this page on Dromaeosaurs. This is published in the earliest 1980s, right around the same time that Baryonyx was first being announced. Um, most of this stuff was written in, like, the 70s, honestly, by David Norman. This is uh, Illustrated Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs. This is my, you know, well, this is my Bible when I was a kid, you know? Uh, Deinonychus, Dromaeosaurus, and little Velociraptor back here, way off in the background, from Mongolia. Velociraptor was an obscure dinosaur prior to Jurassic Park. Deinonychus was where it was at. Everybody talked about Deinonychus. Deinonychus was in all of the children's dinosaur books and everything. There are songs about it. There are models of it. You look at dinosaur documentaries prior to Jurassic Park. Anytime there's a dromaeosaur, it's always Deinonychus. And uh, Greg Paul, or excuse me, Michael Crichton, when he was writing Jurassic Park, took notice. He wanted a small, kind of like person-sized dinosaur to be an antagonist in the novel. And he chose Deinonychus. But Michael Crichton wanted his book to be on the cutting edge of science at the time. So he made sure to actually reference some of the latest publications in dinosaur paleontology. And this book, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World, was clearly very influential on him. Here's the thing. He wanted information on Deinonychus, but in this book... Deinonychus didn't get called Deinonychus right there. It got called Velociraptor instead. So Deinonychus Enteropus was renamed by Greg Paul as Velociraptor Enteropus. And when you read the novel Jurassic Park, it's referred to as Velociraptor Enteropus. That dinosaur we now recognize as, you know, it's Deinonychus. Greg Paul was wrong about this. These are not the same genus of dinosaur. Um, anyway. Yeah. He also sank uh, Soranithalestes into the genus Velociraptor, too. 
So anyway, in this book, Greg Paul calls Deinonychus Velociraptor. And in Jurassic Park, in the novel, Michael Crichton calls Deinonychus Velociraptor. That's why the Deinonychus in Jurassic Park get called Velociraptor. And when you look at the dig site scene uh, from the 1993 film Jurassic Park, Yeah. Um. Here we go. The skeleton that you see here is not of a Velociraptor. It's of a Deinonychus. It's got that distinct tall skull like that. Big ol' antorbital fenestra. Yeah, and it's also much bigger than Velociraptor would be. It's Deinonychus sized, or even larger. It's honestly bigger than just about any Deinonychus would be. It's Hollywood, so they kind of supersize it. But anyway, it's also dug up in Montana. See? Near Snakewater, Montana. Not a real place, but Montana. Deinonychus is from Montana. Velociraptor is from Mongolia. And there's the skull right there again. See that tall structure of the skull? This is the skull of Velociraptor. Nice and dorsoventrally compressed. It's got a very kind of narrow, depressed snout like that. This is life-size, by the way. This is uh, a cast of uh, a Velociraptor skull. So an exact copy of the real thing. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. I should really make a video about that. Velociraptor versus Deinonychus. Why the Jurassic Park... Velociraptor is actually Deinonychus. All that good stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you two uh, dig up dig up dinosaurs? Yes, indeed, Delta Rain. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and would have still been scared if they were that size in the movie? Yeah, Freya's Fury. An animal like this. People are scared of turkeys, you know? Imagine if you had a turkey that was a little bit bigger and also had huge vicious claws on its hands and a mouthful of uh, formidable teeth. That's, uh, that's not a turkey I would want to run into in a dark alley, you know? So, yeah. Anyway. And Mikey Likes says, So Velociraptor was really about the size of a golden retriever then? More or less, Mikey Likes, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, yeah. You've not been close to a live turkey? Well, shoot. I know I've shown this before, but, uh... Maybe there's a video. I've shown you articles, but, uh... Yeah. Here we go. Take a look at this. From, uh... From near where I live. This evening, an Oakland community is rallying behind an animal who's known for some pretty foul behavior. That's right. KPX 5's Don Ford on the effort to save <laughs> Gerald the turkey. Yeah. The Welcome Rose Garden here in Oakland is a very pleasant and serene place. <laughs> Until you run into Gerald. Gerald is a huge male turkey. He lives full time in the Rose Garden, usually somewhat tame, but recently very aggressive. This turkey jumped on you? He just uh, walked towards me and hit my hand How really hard. Hard. It really hurt. Yeah. I thought he had broken a bone or something. <laughs> the attack left Steve bleeding. Several reports. Ah, uh, he's lucky to be alive. Folks, for weeks. It's it's a very extreme <laughs> end of uh, an aggressive male turkey. So there's mating season. Um, somebody has been feeding the turkey, so oh, yes. um, has Always really. a problem. Yes. Oakland is working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to capture Gerald. Traps yep. are set. Sexy decoy, stand ready. And the plan is to relocate, <laughs> not kill him. Folks, yeah. he's been hiding for days. Gerald will jump at you, get you with the beak. And, you know, I knew pretty early on that uh, I needed to back away. <laughs> but then I've, I've seen Gerald really, uh, really chase some folks around the park, especially some, yeah. of, the, some of the elderly folks. You know, I worry oh, about Oh, yeah, he picks on them. This or did anyway. I searched the park for Gerald, but only found these hens and their large chicks. Gerald huh. nowhere to be seen. 
And despite the attacks, he is still liked. We love Gerald the turkey. Oh. Of course, we don't want anybody to get hurt. Right. Yeah. But we also want people to understand that this is his home uh -huh. and how do you act and treat wild animals. Meanwhile, until he is captured, signs warn visitors not to beat or harass wildlife, especially <laughs> turkeys. There's been a number of attacks, but I think it has a lot to do with uh, uh, he's protecting his family. In Oakland, Don Ford, KPIX5. Yep, there you go. Uh, Gerald the turkey. Turkeys can be pretty formidable animals. And, well, shoot, here... This is, oh man, you love to see it. Aggressive turkey stops cop from giving driver a speeding ticket. Man. Right. Let them fight. This is in Livermore, California. Which is not too far away from where I live, I suppose. It's over the hills. Turkey versus Robocop. <laughs> oh, I'm not going over there again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, turkey's like, all cops are mammals. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the motorcycle. Uh oh, sabotage. <laughs> it's pecked through the fuel line, sir. Anyway, uh, salute to that brave dinosaur warrior. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Uh, anyway, yeah. We, I think we've gone through all of our... Oh, no, not quite. There's a couple more. Uh, San Diego Zoo Parrot. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And yeah, this this is true, Claire Burt. Yeah, so we're not going to watch this one. Thank you, Art. But we are going to try and keep this to... Yeah, photos or videos that we've taken ourselves, just so it doesn't... you got to draw the line somewhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Some days the bear is a turkey. There you go, Delta Rain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I can I appreciate... I was I'm feeling the same way, I can Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but good stuff. Good stuff. And now you're good, Miss Yvette. You're good. No worries. Yeah. Happy Thursday, Birds Day, everybody. Let me show you my Thursday, Birds Day bird. Uh, here we go. And... Hang on, why is it not on here? Did it not upload properly? I uh, made a, an iNaturalist uh, observation. Oh, finally, now it's sinking. Goodness. It's because I hadn't... Uh... There we go. Yeah. Nope, it's still not updated. My goodness. Well, let me just find the photo in Google Photos real quick. But I encountered a very interesting gull a while ago. There we go. Uh, this, dear viewers, is a gull. At Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. And I knew that I had to snap a picture of this, log it to iNaturalist, and present it for Thursday Bird's Day, because I was not familiar with this kind of gull. If you're 
like this. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Why did cephalopods evolve to be so cool? Sorry, not related, but I guess some birds eat squid. That's true, Naderfeen. Uh, what do you mean by so cool? I, uh, I don't know how to answer that, Naderfeen. What do you... Ask a more specific question. Shoot. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. We actually don't have a great fossil record for things like squids and octopus, but we do have a pretty good fossil record for ammonites. I can talk about them in a few minutes if you'd like. But yeah, and thank you, Nell, for the hydrate. Yeah. This is a Hearman's gull, which I was kind of surprised. I think normally these gulls are pretty timid in your typical urban environments, in parking lots, you know, near food courts and stuff. You'll see ring-billed gulls. You'll see California gulls. Um, maybe a glaucus winged gull if you're lucky. Hearman's gulls, though, are usually pretty timid. And, uh, yeah, this was pretty neat. Let's look up Hearman's gulls real quick. Or, you know what? Shoot. Gulls and kitty wakes. Yeah, Hearman's gull. Wow, there we are. Very cool. Near threatened is the conservation status. I thought that they were not particularly common. But what a cool bird for uh, for Thursday Bird's Day. Really, really neat. Um, what a cool animal. Very, very cool. So, yeah. Happy Thursday Bird's Day, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. Well, that having been said... And with that having been done, I'm not ready to end the stream yet. I want to keep going. So we're going to continue that documentary that we started a while ago. Uh, Dinosaurs of the Gobi. Or what was it called? Um, there we go. Yeah, and we will continue right here. This is an American Museum of Natural History crew out in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. Digging up dinosaurs, and we're going to get into the birds part. In... where is that? Right... here. I hope to hurt you again. Take pride in my work. The next year we'll bring some... Yeah. The prehistoric sandstorm buried dinosaurs at every stage of life. Very nice. On their first expedition here, Mark and Mike made an unprecedented discovery. A so that's Michael Novacek and Mark Norell, two American Museum of Natural History paleontologists. And uh, I used to watch this documentary with my field crew. Denver Fowler had a copy of this on his laptop hard drive. Or his external hard drive, and we used to uh, we used to watch this on rain days sometimes. If it was too rainy for us to be able to actually go out and dig up dinosaurs during a given day, like we normally would, we'd have to find other things to do in camp. We'd do data entry. We'd clean things up. We'd, you know, organize supplies. We'd do this and that. And that's once we were finished with our chores. Sometimes we'd get together and just sit around and watch a documentary or something like that. Or we watch a movie. That's how I saw my first Star Trek movie. We watched Star Trek The Wrath of Khan one day, and that was, uh, that was fun. Denver's like, Danny, you'll like it. It's, it's a submarine movie, basically. And it basically is. It's structured exactly like a submarine movie, you know? Anyway, Denver also had this on his hard drive, and it was really cool to be able to kind of watch this and see how other other paleontologists do work in the field. Here we are, a crew of paleontologists, you know, sitting in camp, wishing we could go out and dig. But instead, we got to uh, kind of share in the triumphs and tribulations of another paleontological crew from another time through this documentary. See how they do things. It was a lot of fun. A nest with eggs. Yeah. And inside one was an embryo. Yeah. Of an overraptor. 
like a dinosaur on the half shell. Oh, look at that little critter. It was the vicious carnivore, the egg thief. <laughs> Over, probably not a carnivore. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It was an important discovery. Yeah. A moment in the very beginning of this strange dinosaur's life. <laughs> this year, they're hoping to find out more about the these brooms. And its I've never had to deal with sand like this in the field, but I guess he would have full-size brooms like that, huh? Yeah. There's growing excitement on the far side of the ridge. Ah. Uh, they found a completely new kind of dinosaur. Oh, we were talking about this last time. Of the Oviraptor, and it may shed light on what ultimately happened to the dinosaurs. Mm. We have no idea what this is. Those are... A really big animal. Again, to me, those look like ossified tendons. It's some sort of ornithischian dinosaur, most likely. And given that they're working... It might even be Pinacosaurus, actually. It's probably an Ankylosaur, I would bet you. It could be the same Pinacosaurus we saw earlier that, you know, said it looked like an armored coffee table or Ankylosaur. That might be what this is. Pinacosaurus is also from the same time and same place. It might be something. Oh, yeah. This specimen has a lot of important implications that go beyond just being a really beautiful object. So those look like ossified tendons. Exactly tonight. what we wanted to find. It's like an Anki tail. We hope. The skeleton is what's important. Mark and Mike believe that these bones may help prove an exciting theory. That some dinosaurs actually evolved. They evolved into creatures that are still alive today. Oh, and what might those creatures be? Hmm. Anybody think they might know? It's not like we just spent an hour talking about this. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, Crocodile, you're very funny, Real Man Groovers. Welcome back, Real Man. Good to see you here. Yeah. Uh, Burbs, indeed. And if it hadn't been for that great dinosaur who saved us from the American forces, we would all be dead. And holy cow, Hike the Earth. What a dire story. Uh, thank you for the eight, eight months of support and, like, right back at you, Hike the Earth. Thank you, thank you. As dinosaurs evolved into birds. This was still a novel idea back in the 1990s when this came out. I mean, when, uh, when was this? Let's see. Uh, there we go. Uh, Dinosaur Hunter Secrets of the Gobi Desert. So many places you can see this on YouTube. 1996. This is pretty funny because this actually came out like the same year that we started to realize, hey, dinosaurs had feathers. Holy cow. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is which is pretty cool. Uh, so this is really one of the last times when you could still kind of portray this as a new idea. <laughs> Excuse me. The skeleton is what's important. Mark and Mike believe that these bones may help prove an exciting theory that some dinosaurs actually evolved. They evolved into creatures that are still alive today. Yes. Not Puma men, Chris. Birds! <laughs> there are uncanny similarities in the skeletons of certain dinosaurs. Like these. Yep. Is that Yenornis? Who is that? And modern birds. Yep. Oh, yeah. Almost without doubt, they shared a close common ancestor. And each new find may help prove that dinosaurs did not really go extinct. Mm -hmm. That birds, in fact, are dinosaurs. Yes, indeed. Dinosaurs need to be thought of as incredibly successful animals that exist with us today. And we just call them birds. Our skies yep. are filled with dinosaurs. <laughs> Sand 
hell great it's one of those. It's a bad metaphor to use to call something like dinosaur-like, you know, just because it's old, obsolete, ugly, stupid, and slow. I mean, that, uh, that's not what these animals are, are all about. I mean, it's like the swifts flying around here and things. I mean, they're a type of dinosaur. Yep. Yes, indeed. And the closest uh. relative to birds is these small carnivorous dinosaurs we've collected in these red rocks. <clears throat> Yeah, life in camp. I think we watched this last time too. Find will help yeah. the dots between dinosaurs and birds. Ah, uh, camp life the in the field. Of anticipation is oh, I miss this. If not always exactly in key. That's Luis Chiappe there. What is this? Somebody's throwing him a jar of a plastic container. That's got to be some kind of alcohol in there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is. But I bet you it's strong stuff. If they're drinking it in Mongolia. Uh, First field moonshine? Back at the Could be. So we hope uh, we got something we can identify eventually. So Mike, work on that. Kill that beetle while you're at it. As they pry the rock open, they sense trouble. Uh oh. Oh. I know that texture. Look at that. Yeah. I don't know what that is. We're a bunch it's of an osteoderm. Students, maybe. I'm afraid to say. Could it be a theropod with arms? No. no. That's a thyreophorin. That's an ankylosaurus. It's probably Pinacosaurus. I think what we're looking at is a uh, theropod right there that's gone. And we're excavating an ankylosaur. And the ankylosaurs are among the most common dinosaurs around. It's what I tell you, it's an ankylosaur. This is an ornithischian dinosaur, not a theropod. That line of ossified tendons should have given it away. It's an ankylosaur. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Amelia Bedelia wants to know, how old were you when you did your first dig? I, uh, I was... Goodness. 19. I was 19 when I went on my first dinosaur dig. Yeah. Yeah, growing up in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, in coastal California, we don't have dinosaurs around here, you know? I dug up a few fossils before, a few, but yeah, my first real real paleontological field work was, uh, was when I was 19 years old. Yeah. And I've been doing that ever since, you know? Today, of course, I'm uh, 21. 21 years old. And, um, so yeah, two, it's two years I've been digging up dinosaurs. No, I've been digging up dinosaurs for, um, honestly, more than a decade, you know? Nearly a century. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I won't tell you how old I am. But yeah, uh, 21 plus shipping and handling. There you go, paper cuts. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, Miss Yvette says, Danny, do you think more found in San Diego? Oh, more dinosaurs found in San Diego? Yes. Than in the San Francisco Bay Area? Absolutely. Yeah. Aleta Pelta is from down near San Diego. Uh, our best California dinosaurs from near San Diego. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and there's the wish list. Thank you, Lenina, for pulling that up. Uh, anywho. You know, I... I was actually going to make some, uh, some bean dip for dinner. I should probably get around to doing that. I make a big, big old pot of bean dip that I can eat throughout the rest of the week with burritos, with rice, 
with chips, with salsa, with all kinds of stuff. So I, it's about time for me to get started with that. So which also means it's about time to get started wrapping up tonight's stream. Don't go away yet, everybody. <clears throat> Not just yet. We're going to find somebody else to raid and continue our science love for the evening. Let's see who else is live on Twitch that we can raid into. But, uh, yeah. Oh, Volcano Doc is on. It's been forever since we've seen Volcano Doc. What is she up to? We are going to go right into Volcano Doc, a volcanologist, a scientist who studies volcanoes. Volcano Doc, there we go. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful stream. I hope you had a great time today. I certainly did. Happy Thursday, Bird's Day to you. Thank you to lurkers and chatters and question askers. Thank you to everybody who supported this channel financially this is a free broadcast that's my whole purpose here on twitch is to do science outreach but those of you who support me financially that it's you go above and beyond and i appreciate that so much so thank you thank you for that for making all of this possible thank you moderators subscribers and gifters and everybody we're gonna go say hello to a volcano geologist in just a minute here but tomorrow, everybody, we're going to be talking about these remarkable animals, pangolins. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow is World Pangolin Day. So if you'd like to learn what in the world this creature is and what makes it so special, make sure you turn into tomorrow's, tune into tomorrow's broadcast. Anyway, for now, though, let's go say hello to Volcano Doc. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for being here, and uh, I hope to see you tomorrow. All right, bye-bye. Oh, no, Dr. Derp, like, this is one of the big things that we're trying to do. We don't all... We don't always... Just be Nigel with the brain. <laughs>